All right, here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Gumballs. Today on the show, we have a very special guest. We have Dan Spencer. Dan, how's it going? Welcome to the show, dude. <laughs> Happy to so have much, you here. Man. <laughs> I'm excited. This is, yeah, it's exciting. I've heard a lot about all the stuff all previous guests have been on here, so it's, I'm excited. Yeah, I've had nine, you're the ninth guest on. Really? And four of the nine have recommended you. Oh, really? <laughs> You've been highly... <laughs> Requested by the audience and by my uh, my my guests. So really, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, for sure. So, you are not. You have a lot of cool stories, from yeah. what I understand. A few. <laughs> so, how would how when people ask you like, introduce yourself? What do you typically say? How do you start it off? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I always say I'm Daniel Spencer in a very monotone voice. <laughs> I'm Daniel Spencer. Uh, I always like to start off that I'm African because I think I'm Zimbabwean and so that always comes up in conversation no matter what because they always are going to ask me about my accent so I just get it yeah. out of the way. Just like, no, I'm from Zimbabwe, uh, I like to do stand-up, I like, I don't know, I'm gay now so that's, yeah. a, that's a thing and so yeah, I usually bring up those three things because that's what people know me for. Basically. Okay, let's start with the whole, with the, you're from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. When you tell people that... Do they believe you? No, they don't believe me at all. <laughs> also, the last because it's the last thing that they expect, right? Like the last thing that they expect is a like a fat white <laughs> guy from Africa. Like that's the last thing you'd expect. So it's always like, it's always funny to like watch how people try to go around it. You know <laughs> what I mean? They're like, okay, but you weren't born there, and I was like, no, I'm born there. Okay, but you didn't live there, and you're like, no, I lived there, and they're like. <laughs> like, they just can't, like, they can't, like, let it just, like, be. Like, it's, like, it's 2019. Also, like, white people have been in Africa for a while. Like, it's, colonialism was a bad thing. But, like, yeah, there are white people everywhere, pretty much. And it just is, like, there are, I don't know, all sorts of races everywhere else. You know what I mean? Like, it's just so weird to, like, that they can't, like, let it, like, they can't just be okay. <laughs> that it's, yeah. like, I am from Africa, you know? So, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I told sort of people that I'm having to get on the podcast tonight from Zimbabwe. <laughs> And the first thing he said, oh, is he black? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, no, it's not black. When I did a mission, uh, all my companions, they were always like, because the assistants would be like, you got the Zimbabwean guy. And everyone was like, wow. And then I like got off of a plane or I got off a boat and they'd be like <laughs> super disappointed. They were like, oh, he's not black. Was, okay, cool, whatever. So I yeah, am, it was interesting. He must be used to all those questions then. Yeah, it, like, it comes up so frequently, like it's like, at this point, it's I use the same jokes for every single the white African line. I always use that because I know it's gonna get a laugh. So I'm like, there we go, here we go. <laughs> so it, it it's always fun to just like, I don't know, talk about it with people yeah. and see the different reaction and see if I can come up with some new material because always it contributes to a lot of my comedy too. So that's always nice. I bet because I mean that's not common to have a white guy from Zimbabwe. Yeah, I feel like I contradict so much. <laughs> Right? Like, I'm, like, a white African gay Mormon. Like, it's so, like, all those combinations just don't yeah. fit. And it's like, wow, like, <laughs> no one knows quite how to, like, balance it out. I don't know. It's interesting. So, when did you come to Utah, then? I came here four years ago. Uh, it's five years in May, so. So, have you been, so, I guess, what, what brought you here to Utah? Uh, obviously, the... You know, growing up Mormon, like, yeah. the, the thing was, like, our dad, it was interesting, because our dad's American, so he's from Colorado, and, uh, but we lived, born and raised in Zimbabwe, um, we visited twice in my life, once when I was six and once when I was 16, mm -hmm. um, but other than that, we didn't really have, like, a point of reference for America, we just knew our parents went there occasionally, mm -hmm. and, like, they'd always tell us about, like, this magical Mormon school in the mountains, <laughs> that was, like... It's going to be great, and it's super cheap school. So I was like, okay, I guess that's the goal. Um, so when I did apply to u universities, like, that was, like, the thing. was, like, you're going to be where you, yeah. And my sisters were here, so I was like, yeah, Utah will probably be where I end up. And I did. And so, yeah, just BYU became the choice. And that was the whole thing that motivated me moving to Utah. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to NYU, um, and I did apply there. And I think, uh, if I remember correctly, I got in, but, uh, and I did get a scholarship to some random, like, animation art school in, like, Florida. Um, but, yeah, it was, like, it was NYU or BYU, and BYU ended up being the choice, so. How was your up in Zimbabwe? 
It was always interesting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we had a dictator, so, you know, oh, dictator. What was his name? He died recently. Yeah, Robert Mugabe. Yeah, Mugabe. Uh, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. Um, and he, I don't know, it made it, it made it a little bit crazy at times. Um, but, like, it was such a beautiful place to grow up in. I think a lot of people think, <laughs> it was really funny growing up because, like, our dad's family, obviously, were all here in America. And they'd hear all these crazy stories about, like, hyperinflation and war and, like, violence and everything like that. Because that's what the news covered. But, like, for the most part, like, if you were just smart, nothing really happened to you, you know? We did have, like, a lot of turmoil. We did have a lot of, like, protests and, like, people being killed. For the most part, you know, like, I don't think Zimbabweans are innately violent. And that's, they love Americans, to be honest with you. Like, <laughs> Americans are like celebrities to them, honestly. Like, it's like insane. Like, I remember like Americans would come and be like, wow, they're American. <laughs> like, <laughs> like everyone, like all of us just thought like, wow, Americans make it so unique. Because you grow up watching Hollywood films. Mm -hmm. And so like that, like kind of changed like the perspective for us. Is like, we were always just super nice. But like our par like my dad's parents and like his family, were super nervous to come and visit us because all they heard was the bad parts. Yeah. They never saw the good parts. But it's like my dad was like, I promise it's good. I promise it's okay. You've been here before. Let's do this thing. And so, yeah, it just was like, it was always interesting growing up in that way because we had, we always had to like find ways to convince foreigners that it was like, okay, to visit Zimbabwe. But like, yeah. And then, in terms of growing up there in general, like, I grew up in an all-boys school. I went to an all-boys school. Um, I mean, I started in co-ed, I guess. I was co-ed until sixth grade. And then, from sixth grade on, I was all-boys. That was good. It was it was interesting being, like, a closeted gay guy mm -hmm. there uh, in those situations, just because you were always, like, stressing out. Because it's very, like, it's very testosterone. Macho. Yeah, like, oh, we're just <laughs> men, yeah. you know? And so, like, anything that was, like, effeminate or anything like that was, like, completely shunned, done away with. Like, people used to beat people up just because they were kind of, like, acting in a weird yeah. way. And so, like, I was very careful in that way. Um, and I'm trying to think of anything else. I mean, we have lions and cool stuff like that. Yeah. But not... That's another question I get from Americans. They're like, wow, like, does wildlife just freely roam around? And Walk it's like, in your backyard. No, I live in a city. <laughs> like, there's suburban homes. Like, I mean, I ha you, you get the occasional, like, monkey that, like, That'd wanders cool. off. But that happened, like, maybe once every five years, <laughs> right? Like, you were, and you were always, like, confused. you were like, wow, a monkey, yeah. right? Like, it'd be like if you guys had a monkey show up in your backyard. You're like, oh, this is weird. Okay. But yeah, so that was always like an interesting thing. And so those are usually the questions I get, like what are the dynamics there? But yeah, we don't have wild animals running around freely. So yeah. yeah. So what, what took your parents to Zimbabwe? Um, so my dad and my mom actually, their original plan was to live in Colorado. Um, and they did, they had my first sister there. And then my dad got fired from a tire store and my mom was about to deliver my second sister, and she was like, let's just go to Zimbabwe. And from what I understand of the story, and they can correct me on this, but from what I understand is they, my mom wanted some, one of her kids to be born in Zimbabwe, and she was like, let's just go have Brittany there, we can relax and figure out life there, and come back, and then we'll wow. sort stuff out. And they moved over there, and then I think my mom and dad just saw more opportunity business-wise. You know, yeah. they didn't have degrees, and they were trying to figure out what they how they were going to raise their family, and there was just more opportunities for people that weren't college graduates out there at that point. And so my dad got into fried chicken, as a, he like managed a fried chicken establishment. Really? And then they brought in pizza, and so my mom and my dad kind of went into the pizza business. My dad like took wow. a chain to multiple countries, it's called Pizza Inn. It, like, Shout out to Pizza Inn. Pizza Inn, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he took pizza into a few countries, and then he started doing grocery stores after that. And now he's back in chicken and pizza. Pogo's chicken and pizza. The best Shout pizza. Shout Pogo's. <laughs> that is awesome. So, yeah. So, I think it was just a matter of, like, where they were most comfortable and where there was the most opportunity. They just didn't see it here in America. And, and like, it was really funny because every time, every time there was turmoil in Zimbabwe, like, my dad was like, that's it. We're leaving. We're going to America. We're going to leave. And, like, we'd call our friends. And we'd be like, we're going to America. And then, like... Out of nowhere, and then yeah, and then my dad would be like, "No, I've prayed about it. We're staying." <laughs> so, like, 
okay, that's fine then, I guess. So it was always interesting. Yeah, it was always interesting growing up like that too. So did you ever like witness, like you said, bad things? Like, did you ever like witness or see any of that, or was it usually pretty safe for for you guys growing up? Um, I had a few instances where like I kind of came within the vicinity of stuff, but to be honest with you. Our parents were pretty good about like keeping us in like the nice thing is like everyone's houses are walled off and so mm -hmm. when there was serious serious like turmoil our mom and dad just like kept us in the house serious in what sense um there was people being killed uh oh, that is so serious. the thing about the political system there was that there was two parties zanu pf which was the main dictatorship party mm -hmm. and then there was led by robert mugabe and then there was morgan Tangeray's mdc party um, and so the big thing was that they were trying to get Zanu PF out of power. Obviously, Morgan Chandra was very be well backed back in the day, and so especially by like America and the West, and so they kind of used that in propaganda. They were like, "Oh, the West wants mm -hmm. him to be a leader," and like it was a bit crazy. Um, but basically, what ended up happening was that uh, Robert Mugabe, I think in nineteen ninety six. Uh, basically started saying that like uh, war veterans from the Civil War, uh, the war in, from independent, before independence, uh, could reclaim land, African land, okay. for, their own, for themselves. And I do agree with that. I think, you know, like reparations in some form, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, in some way, there needs to be some sort of reparation for all the crap that white people did to black people. But what they ended up doing was going onto farms and killing one, uh, they started like beating up and killing people, um, mainly other Africans. Uh, I mean, it was like the workers who had the livelihoods on their livelihood on the farms yeah. that they were reclaiming, and so that became like a big serious situation. And then that progressed and progressed to kill the whites, kill oh, people that support the MDC party, kill you know. It needed to be like we need to take action essentially, and so that's when you started seeing like crazy. Protests, crazy, viol crazy violence just in the streets in general. And so, yeah, my parents were always really good about just keeping us in our houses. And they were like, you're not going to school today. We're just going to chill. And we just sit and watch the news the whole time and see what the news was saying, you know, about the situation. So, Were you ever scared? Um, a few times. There was like a few instances where we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Not a lot, but like... You just never knew what like what could happen. Was were you in the wrong like spot? I remember there was a uh, my sister's friend. Uh, her because there was different signs. So the Zanu PF sign is a fist. Uh -huh. The MDC sign is a hand. Okay. Um, if I remember the story correctly. She was waving at her friend, and the Z there was Zanu PF supporters there. Saw her waving, and they beat her. Oh my gosh! Up. And so. We were in the same area. We weren't watching. We weren't there when that all went down. But we were in the same area a few days later, and we were stressing out because we ended up in that spot, and mm -hmm. we weren't sure what was going to happen. And so it's just like, you know, again, you just have to be smart, have to kind of like avoid the bad situations. And I'm, I'll say that we were pretty lucky about like avoiding all sorts of like crazy stuff. Like my mom and my dad were always very. An interesting story I tell people. Um, my dad, when he was running grocery stores, he had a cafe in his grocery store. And, uh, during the time where there was like serious hyperinflation, um, to the point where you were like, literally people were weighing money. Oh, that was like their wages. You had yeah, to get so paid. Had like, like a, like a billion dollar yeah, bill. Yeah. We went to a hundred trillion dollar note and oh, it would have been octillion, but they stopped it at that point. Oh, like, yeah. Let's, so close. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Octillion <laughs> would have been so cool. Uh, but once the, once the hyperinflation was kind of like peaking, um, to try and like, I guess, promote like, uh, GDP and all that sort of stuff, the government started forcing grocery stores to only sell local products. Um, hmm. and so that kind of limited a lot of the grocery stores profitability. And so my dad being one of the grocery store owners, um, came together with a whole bunch of other grocery store owners and they agreed not to open on a particular day. But what was interesting about that was that my dad um, always had this one guy in his cafe uh, visiting, and he would always just pay for his breakfast randomly. He's like, oh, I'll just pay for his breakfast. He's always here. Like, he's a good guy. Yeah. Whatever. And then the day before they were, to, they were going to shut down the grocery stores, 
um, that guy came up to him, my dad and was like, hey, do you know who I am? And he was like, I have no idea. And he was like, I'm the head of Zona PF Youth, which is pretty much like the equivalent of Hitler's yeah. youth, you know. Um, and he was like, uh, don't shut your store tomorrow. And my dad was like, what? <laughs> what? He's like, what? don't what? shut your store tomorrow. He's like, you need to open. And my dad was <laughs> stressing out because he was like, what the, what the <laughs> hell? Like, <laughs> super scary, super, super ominous. Um, and uh, so my dad was the only... And, you know, my dad trying to tell people, he's like, look, like, they're going to send, like, the youth and all this sort of stuff. And the grocery stores were like, we'll, we'll be fine. Like, it's okay. Dad was like, I can't do that. I'm going to open my store. I don't want to put my workers at risk. I don't want to put anyone at risk. So I'm going to open my store. What happened was that my dad was the only grocery store that opened that day. Everyone else got taken and put into jail. My dad also got put into jail, but... They got taken to jail and beaten up, and my dad oh my <laughs> just got taken to jail, basically, from what I remember. It was like a really shady situation. I remember also my dad, like, he told us a story where the, it was just a bit, like, it's always just been a bit wild, like, growing up there. But our dad had a time where he just, like, kind of disappeared for a couple of days, and we had no idea where he was. And I think it was around that same time. Um, but he just had, like, those crazy experiences, but he never got beaten up the same way that the other grocery store owners got beaten up. He never had, like, anything. And that could also be contributed to the fact that he's American, you know? I think they knew he was an American. I think at one point, <laughs> people were, like, confronting him about it, and they were like, You're an imperialist pig who's <laughs> trying to overthrow the country. And he's like, If a grocery store owner can overthrow your country, your country has some really messed up problems and issues, and yeah. you might want to redo something here. And so, yeah, it was interesting. It was always, it was always, I'd say cool to see how my dad just kind of followed his gut in mm -hmm. a lot of ways to make sure that, like, he knew he felt right and safe about situations, you know? He really took all the precautions he possibly could to make sure that, like, one, his business functioned well, but two, that we were all safe and that he was safe, too. So it was really, it's really fun. And he still does that today. Like, he's really good about it. He, he's always been a nice guy, always just been super friendly. And it's the same to be said for my mom. Like, I think they kind of had to just learn how to be friendly with everyone. Because I think having six kids kind of <laughs> forced that upon them. They were like, we're going to have a lot of people around and we need to like learn how to be okay with every person no matter what. And so, Was that typical in Zimbabwe to have a family of six kids? No. People were so... Especially like white Africans. Like... Mm -hmm. I think the usual, like, average is one, like, between two, anywhere between one and three, uh, really. Um, so and so, like, average six, <laughs> six yeah, yeah, in Utah, I was like, ah, that's normal. <laughs> I remember, yeah, it was just, everyone thought, like, my mom was, like, a hero. But it also, like, some people who heard that my dad was Mormon was like, oh, polygamy. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, no, a woman can have six kids. And I was like, no, I don't believe it. You know, it was just super interesting. And so, yeah, uh, that wasn't very, very common. I'd say that, like, uh, what was also interesting about our childhood is that, like, we always grew up with, they had six kids, but all of us might, like, we didn't really like being around, like, white culture, the white African culture. Why, why is that? Why is I, I don't know. I've thought about it for a long time. I think it's just because, like, having six kids made it kind of, like, I don't know. I think we just related more to, like, the black community than the white community in a lot of ways. Like, black people were just, like, way more chill and, like, less judgmental. Mm. And they were just, like, super relaxed about everything. And so we always had a lot of me, myself, included my siblings, we all had, like, mostly black friends. And obviously there were times where we had, like, a lot of, like quite a few black, or, like, white friends. But, yeah. Because uh, we went to private, private schools, you know. Um... But we mostly had black friends because that was just like a place to be where we could be comfortable. And I honestly attribute that to like my dancing skills. I can attribute you, you to that. You can dance. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you you can dance and you can twerk. Well, yeah, but that's the whole thing is it's like that's what I like grew up with. Like I I was more impressed with like the black community than the white <laughs> community, and I was like I'm gonna learn how to dance and I'm gonna learn how to like, you know, just like I don't know. It was so cool to have friends that were more relaxed. They also talked a lot about like. There's thing, there were things that were considered, like, black things to do in, like, high school and, like, school. Uh, and there were white things. And the white things were, like, you know, you did, like, water polo, rugby, cricket, and field hockey. Field hockey is, like, the, I think, the whitest sport. <laughs> yeah. <to come> up. <laughs> and, uh, um, 
like the black sports were like soccer and we weren't even allowed to do soccer they didn't even have soccer in our high school which was crazy really? now they do but like growing up there it was outrageous because they just they considered it a black sport it wasn't like prestigious enough you know it was like mm -hmm. oh that's that's something other people like, it's like it's the biggest sport in the world and yeah, you're not gonna, gonna have it at your school it's trash um soccer basketball uh soccer and basketball were like the main ones um and volleyball i'd say mm. and then like everyone kind of came together with rugby just because that was like the big cultural you know that was like a culturally big thing oh too. was there a sport um, I did rugby. Uh, I played rugby. <laughs> I'd say I'll say this: my parents always wanted me to be like sporty and like encourage me to like play team sports, um, because like growing up again in Africa, we have like uh, corporal punishment. So like people, you get like spankings. Like we whippings. call it we call it whippings because it's yeah we get whipped with a cane right like so oh yeah like <laughs> sticks and canes and so that was always interesting. But uh, what we had was we had. To do either two clubs in a sport or like uh, extra, extracurricular wise, or you did uh, two sports in a club. Uh -huh. And I ended up just doing a bunch because my parents wanted me to just do sports, but I wanted to do, again, there was things that were considered like black things to do, which was like debate, uh, public speaking, like all these sort of things, which was outrageous. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm sorry that I want to like debate and have good discussions. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That's crazy. Um, so I used to like sneak and do a whole bunch of like random clubs on the side. Good for you. Not because my parents were like, don't do them because they lack things to do. Just because like my parents were like, you need to play sports mostly. Yeah. Like they were like trying to make me do sports. And I was a fat kid who didn't like doing sports. And so I was like, I have to do sports and a whole bunch of clubs. So it was always just like this intermingling of like me trying to find out what I liked. So I did public speaking. I did debate for a little bit. I did like MUN. I did every everything I mm -hmm. possibly could. Just to kind of get a feel, because I knew sports wasn't where I was going to be successful. I was like, I don't like sports, I don't like rugby. Mm -hmm. I kind of grown up with it being more of a punishment than everything. <laughs> they were like, you are going to play sports and you're going to go for a run. And I was like, oh yeah, that sucks. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was always interesting. Like, I look at my brother, who's like, super macho man, loves sports. Yeah. And then there's like me, who's like, I love to dance and do theatre. Like, it's so very... It's very, very different. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's good to have that variety. Because, uh, like, my siblings, so there's th three of us, including me, and I'm not like them at all. Yeah. They're much more social, much more talkative, and they're much more introverted than I am. Yeah. Why would you say that is, do you think? Dude, I have... I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, even my parents are more introverted than me. Like, mm -hmm. I'm much more extrovert. Like, I thrive talking to people. That's one of the reasons I have the podcast. I like to hear stories of different people, talk to them, and hear about their lives. Yeah. But, like, my parents, my siblings, they would never do something like this. And I don't know what made me that way. Have you ever thought about bringing your siblings on the podcast? Yeah, like, that's what they said. They don't want to. <laughs> my mom doesn't want to. My dad doesn't want to. Yeah. I, I, I can kind of relate with, like, my stand-up stuff. My mom and my dad, like... They, I don't think they fully, like, all my siblings and everyone, like, I don't think they fully understood until they saw me. Because I did public speaking, and my parents knew that I was, like, that way inclined. But I was always, I was a shy kid. I was a shy-ass kid, dude. Really? Like, I'll say that. Like, I am surprised that you say I that. I mean, like, if once I knew people, like, I was the class clown for sure. But, like, oh, if you okay, you're took okay. me around, yeah. If you take me out of that situation, I was yeah. like, oh, I hate this. I hate parties. I hate people. Like, oh, I don't like this. Um... And it took a long time, I'll say, like, <laughs> I'm very different on stage than I am. Like, I, people, like, see me on social media, and they're like, oh, and then they see me on the road, and they're like, oh, my gosh, it's you! And I'm like, hi, how's it going? And it's, like, totally, I think they expect me to, like, dance, you're, like, you're break here. into song all of a sudden, <laughs> and be like, yeah! I don't know, like, yeah, I'm just not as, I'll say I'm not as crazy all the time. <laughs> But I am a lot more extroverted, and it took it kind of took my myself included, my parents, my siblings, everyone a long time to kind of see that I'm a little bit more like I open up a bit more. And then after I came and started doing stand up, it's just become more and more okay. Maybe you re like relate with the podcast. Like yes, I don't know. Absolutely. Like once you get into the mode of talking to people, it's just like you can't stop, and you just oh, want to yeah. keep. I don't know. Like I usually tell people to come on the show. I say for the first five minutes you're gonna be really nervous. Yeah. But after that, 
It's okay. easy. Like, yeah. you just have a super conversation. Yeah. And that's, I mean, like, that's how it is, like, right now. It's super, super flowing conversation. It's going great. Yeah. But some people just can't do that. Yeah. And I don't understand. So, like, let me ask you, was that the motivation? You were like, I just want to talk to people when I start the podcast, or what? Well, for me, personally, I listen to about 10 hours of podcast a, a day. <laughs> I... I love podcasts. Yeah. I love listening to it. I love the content. I think, I think personally for me, like this is the new medium. Like, like obviously yeah. you, you thrive on social media. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. But, oh, <laughs> oh, man. Like, uh, uh, it's been crazy. Though. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. But like for me, like I think podcasting is just the future. Cause I think, especially nowadays, like with social media, how someone puts out a tweet and we all assume we know who this individual is. Yeah. Oh, that person supports Trump? Oh, he's racist. Or that person supported Hillary? Oh, they're... I don't know. Like, oh, they support... They love abortion and stuff. Yeah, yeah, socialist, you know. Socialist. But it's the fact... Like, down. That's not, that's not it at all. Yeah. And I like this because it's a long-form interview. Yeah. Like, people can come on and you can get to know them individually and know, who, like, truly who they are compared to, like, yes, compared to, like a 10-second video. Yeah. You may think you know them for 10 seconds, but you, <laughs> yeah. you don't. You don't at all. Yeah. You're like, huh, he's not the same person that he, uh, he was on his motivational video. <laughs> so what, what What do you think made you more... Oh, okay, first of all, those motivational videos are absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Put on your flipping deodorant and slay for days. I love those videos. The first one you sent out, I sent to like all my friends and family. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. It's yeah. I film it at four o'clock in the morning, so it means a lot when I hear people be like, "That was good." And I'm like, "Good," because I froze. <laughs> like, I was out last night. It was so bad. I felt so bad. I was shouting on the road. It's uh, University Avenue in Provo, big main road. For those of you that don't know, and uh, I just use it because it's empty at four o'clock yeah. in the morning. Morning, you know, there's no one walking on there. There's no one driving down there, so I'm just like, yeah, and it's well lit as well. And so I was like, yeah, I'll just do this. But last night, I was shouting, as I do, in the empty street. And uh, I woke up a homeless man. <laughs> it was the worst. He was like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to record a video. And he's like, I'm trying to sleep. I have never felt so bad in my entire life. So. You should go on the video and say something like, put on your deodorant or something, or like, stay for days. Yeah, and beat your head. Just be like, hey, say this. <laughs> he like wakes up, like, sir, wake up. You need to tell them to be motivated. What? <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, it was so, I felt so bad last night. But uh, yeah, then I walked a very big distance, and yeah, it was just, that was my first interaction with like recording a video and someone. I mean, like, there's people, there's been people in the distance, yeah. but no one, like, close proximity was, like, taking the full force of me shouting something. Like, I think I was saying, I can't even remember, last night was the World War Three one, but I was saying something around the lines of, like, get your act together! <laughs> so I think he thought I was just shouting at him. I was like, get your act together! And so now I just seem like a totally angry anti. I don't know. It's bad. The noise you make that... Oh, dude, that cracks me up every time. I lose it. I think it's good stuff. It's funny stuff. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. What? You said that your siblings. Yeah. Like you're more like you're different compared to your siblings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What do you think made you that way? Uh, I'm gay. No. <laughs> I do think that as a contributing factor, but they, I think they definitely like my siblings influenced that because my parent, my siblings aren't in necessarily, I mean, they're not super extroverted the same way I am. Like, mm -hmm. they're not down to go on a stage and talk about stuff. They're not down to, like, put pictures up uh, or crazy pictures up on social media. But I think we've always been a very loud family, especially with one another. Um, my writing partner for stand-up is my sister, Hannah. And she, mm. yeah, we... Shout out to Hannah. Yeah, Hannah. Mm. <laughs> uh, I've always told her, I was like, we should just go and like, apply to SNL because we'd kill the game. But it would be so fun. Uh, but she... What, ended, what we always do is, like, when I'm coming up at stand-up set, I'll just call her and we sit for hours just coming up with jokes, you know? Her like, oh, this would be funny if you said this. They'll, like, die laughing. And my brother-in-law is like... <laughs> he has to tell us, like, he has to almost, like, remind us. He's like, hey, 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 you're going too far now. <laughs> like, and so my sister, it's always fun. But, like, that's what I mean. Like, we, we've always been a loud family and a very talkative family with one another. 
And I think I was just like, I just kind of took that energy out into the world in the same way. Like if my siblings did the same thing I did, they would also just be just about, I'd like to think that they'd be just as good at what I'm doing with social media and stand-up as uh, I am. Like I think it would, I think they'd all kill the game. I always tell them to do stand-up, I always tell them to do that stuff because we're all funny in different and weird quirky ways. Mm-hmm. Like you have my older sister Megan and Brittany and Hannah, the three above me, all, <laughs> what I find really funny is that like every time there's a Sunday lunch, all of us just shout as loud as we possibly can. And we argue points and politics and everything. We're like, no, this is how we feel. And then people will come over and be like, wow, they like arguing. And it's like, oh no, this is how we talk. <laughs> this is like, <laughs> this isn't an, like this, it's not an argument. It's just like a friendly conversation yeah. that just increases in li- volume. And so, but like once they go out into the world, I think they like to be a little bit more reserved. Whereas I'm just like, okay, you know, I'm fine to take my shirt off in public and that sort of stuff. And I think that's just partially because we grew up in a community that was told us kind of like, you know, it's fine to be funny, but it's not okay to be crazy extroverted. Mm -hmm. You have to be polite. You have to like say sorry. You have to do like uh, Alex Lorenko, one of your previous guests. Shout out to Alex. Alex. Uh, he used to always tell us to stop saying sorry. Oh, me and my sisters. Because yeah. we'd always say sorry for everything. Like, it was like, oh, I'm so sorry. He's like, you don't have to say sorry for every single thing. Uh, and so that was always an interesting... That, like, helped me kind of gain perspective on that, too. It's just like, you know, there's, there's politeness and then there's being, like, overly polite where it just gets annoying. Mm-hmm. You're like, oh, this is just annoying. And I think that's something that we all suffer from. And now I'm kind of rude. <laughs> and my siblings are still like very polite and so Well maybe you're not rude, but I think Utah is just so kinda of like sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Like my wife always says, Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. You don't need to say sorry to the sales guy for giving him too much money. Like <laughs> it's all right, you know. Yeah. <laughs> or everyone says, uh, thank you so much. You can just say thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I have to, <laughs> there's so many things, like, behaviors I picked up from each other. I'm like, thank you, thank you so much. Every single text message, when people are like, you're great, I'm like, thank you so much. <laughs> and that's all I can reply, and I'm like, I need to go further than that. Like, this is supposed to be a conversation. So, yeah, I'd say, like, it's it's just a product of that. Like, I don't know, you probably relate in that way, because you've grown up in Utah, too. It's like, you were taught to respect your elders. And it's almost more extreme, a little bit in Zimbabwe, because you're like, it's corporal almost, you know, like, very, like, stand up when a lady walks into mm-hmm. the room, uh, never leave a party without hugging every single person, like, that's how we grew up, like, we, it was like, you have to, you have to, like, be polite, and so, yeah, my, I think a lot of us ended up being, I'm still to this day, I'm a people pleaser. Really? Yeah, like, uh, it's getting hard, hard because obviously I'm getting like a lot of like... Yeah, you're kind of like famous, so... <sighs> no. Uh, like, it's not, well, like TikTok famous, which is not really famous, but like, people know who I am. And now I'm getting like endorsement deals and Good like... You. Interesting, you know, like little projects, nothing crazy big. I'm not like getting reached out by like... Not yet. Like Coke or... Uh, yeah, that would be amazing. But uh, the... It's, it, when I first started getting them, it was really hard for me to say no to stuff. Um, just because I was so scared. I was like, well, I don't want to refuse this person mm-hmm. because I feel like I have a duty to them. And I don't. Like, I don't have to say yes to someone. Like, uh, I ran a meme account, the meme account, Propo Life, and uh, people would send me pictures and i just post them. And uh, some of them were trash. <laughs> but I felt so bad because I was like, oh, I'm messaging this person and they want their stuff out there. And... Was that entirely bad? No. Because I think it helped the account. It helped the girls. Yeah, people were like, wow, my meme made it onto a meme account, you know? But at the same time, I had to learn how to be like, no, there needs to be some sort of consistency, some sort of, you know, balance. And now I'm getting that a lot with the endorsement deals and stuff. I always have to call, actually, my siblings. I call a lot of them when I get these deals because... Uh, and a few friends, actually, um, just to kind of get in, uh, like, gauge it. I'm like, do you think this sounds good? I always send the text to the group chat. I'm like, does this look shady? Does it not look shady? 
because I'm still in that mode of like, well, maybe I should just say yes to see what happens. And it's like, no, like you really have to be picky. You have to be choosy now. You yeah. can't just run into an endorsement deal because it's an endorsement deal, you know? And so that's something that I'm trying to learn right now is like to be okay with saying no to people because it's, and it sucks. It sucks because I just want to say yes to everyone. Mm -hmm. I want to say yes to everyone wanting to make a video with me. I want to say yes to everyone trying to like, I don't know, do something with me. But at, at a certain point, mentally, it just gets like hard because you're like, there's so much I have to deal with. Like tonight, I was late to the podcast <laughs> because I kept saying yes to people about yeah. stuff and that just put me in a bad situation. And so, yeah, it was just an interesting thing to deal with. So, how what, what has to happen for you to say no? Like, what do you have to tell yourself to say, okay, Dan, it's okay if I say no to this person, it's not the end of the world? I think it just takes that exact like, wording. It's like... The perspective. Yeah, the perspective of, like, it doesn't matter in the long run. Like, they'll live, I'll live, it'll be fine. I just have to, like, I've always had to look at it in that way. Because I also have to... It's a balance of, because it's not just like um, saying no, it's like you have to take into account your timing and your scheduling. Can you do something, like can you take on a project or can you not take on a project? Like you have to ask yourself all those questions and if you can't, you just have to at the end of the day be like, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Yeah. You know? And again, I feel so bad when people like, I don't know, I want to commit a lot more to people because you want to make people's lives better you want to yeah. make them happy and you want to keep it going but at a certain point you just have to like I had a this past semester I had a super bad uh, thing with um, depression and suicide and like a couple episodes to be honest with you like that sucked um, but because of that the reason why it happened was partially because I kept saying yes to everyone and I got so stressed out by all the like all the needs I had to meet for every single person that it put me in this crazy rut where I was like, I'm not a good person. I keep failing people. I keep doing this stuff. And I was like, no, like you just have to learn to say no. And after that point, I was pretty intent on being like, no, I am not going to put my name on every single project. I'm not going to commit to every single thing out there, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's also kind of where I like, I came to the perspective of like, I need to like, really focus on my friends and family in a lot of ways because I think uh, I saw my family in particular like really support me in that situation and I was like I'm so grateful that I have my family around and they're consistent and they can keep me balanced no matter what mm -hmm. the purpose is and that's when yeah I just learned to appreciate it a lot more not take it for granted the like the connections my siblings or the friendships my siblings have with me and the balance they bring into my life too. Yeah. I really believe that a, the key to life is to be wealthy. And by that I mean wealthy, I mean wealthy in friendships, wealthy in relationships with family, yeah. wealthy with, you know, human connection. Yeah. Because if you don't have that, then life can get real lonely real quick. Yeah. I agree. It's just like, I don't know. And that's the other thing. It's like, I don't know, maybe you have the same... Do you have a good relationship with your siblings? Or yes. Know? You do? Okay. Very so, very like, close. we always ha try and have Sunday lunch as much as possible. Um, just because that's, like, our base and our time to... Like I said, we get together and argue a lot. But, like, it is, like, kind of our time to just kind of refresh and talk out our problems. And it really helps us to just kind of, like, gain perspective. Mm -hmm. You know? And I have a, a lot of friends who do the same thing for me, too. Like... It really, like, when I'm going through something, I can just go to them and be like, hey, I don't know how to deal with the situation. Like, what would you do? And they're like, oh, yeah. Because they also, like, the, the other thing I'm learning is that, like, social media has warped my perception I want to talk of, to like, you. real world, you know, how the real world functions. And so a lot of the time I have to ask someone who isn't in the social media world what they would do in those situations. Because it, like, I don't know. It... <laughs> They, it's really funny because it's just like normal people are like, no, why would you do that? I'm like, you're right. Why? Yeah. Why would I do that? That is a weird thing. And so, yeah, it's funny. But you mentioned earlier, the fights with depression. 
Mm-hmm. How did your, I assume your family, how, how, how essential was your family at that time to help you through that moment? Oh, so, yeah, they were super essential. I sent a text. It was really interesting. I was staying up because, to be honest with you, sleep is a really big thing, I think, in my life that puts me into depression. Like, if I'm deprived of sleep, I, one, stay up and just stay in my thoughts and, like, get into a funk. Uh, And so I had that. I had been working graveyard shifts as well as, like, just going out late. And so my sleep schedule was completely, like, just turned off a loop, basically. And uh, I... I was sitting there one night and I messaged my, my siblings and I was like, hey, I, I'm making it sound super jolly, like, hey, but like, it was, it was like that. It was just like, hey, just so you guys know, I really like, I've been feeling like I'm want to kill myself. I really want to, I really want to do it. I've never felt like this before because I have had episodes where I have had them come and get me and that, you know, they just come and like chill with me for a couple of days, you know, but that was the first time that like. I think I had seriously contemplated, like, no, it'll be fine. And it was really crazy, because that was, like, peak where everyone knew me. I was getting tons of followers on all my platforms. And no one knew that I was going through this crazy stuff, because it was just all the pressure, right? Like, it was the contributing pressure of school. It was the contributing pressure of needing to do projects with other people on social media to try and get big. It was the contributing pressure of, like, oh, I need to, like, be posting every day. Like... That stuff all contributed to me just being like, I really want to kill myself all of a sudden. And it really sucked. And I sent that uh, text that so basically explained that, those exact parameters, like what put me in that depressive state. I was like, and I want to commit suicide really badly. And my siblings came, picked me up. And without like even asking me, doing anything. They set up a whole bunch of doctor's appointments, therapist appointments, and they were just like, we're gonna get you on meds. We're gonna, gonna get you in therapy. Like, we're done with this. Like, you can't just, cause to be honest with you, again, coming from like Africa, the mentality is like, you're not a man. If you can't like push through sadness and push through pain and suck push it through. up and attitude. Yeah, just suck it up and get through stuff. And so I have always been like that. Like, I just need to, it's, it'll just, it'll go away eventually. And mm-hmm. it's like, at a certain point, you have to accept that that isn't the case, especially with suicide and especially with depression and anxiety. Like, you really can't risk that. And so, got on Zoloft, started doing therapy, and I'm, I think I'm way better off for it because, I, I don't know, like, there's so much of a stigma with, especially with medicine for depression, right? Like, People always tell you, like, you will you will just be at this weird middle. You can't have a high and you can't have a low. You're just going to be in this middle. Which is lo- kind of true. But that doesn't mean that you can't have highs. Have idea, yeah. yeah, like, it's like, no, you're in the middle. And you, when the high comes, it'll come. Like, yeah, you're not, like, <laughs> celebrating everything. But at least you're not, like, down in the dumps, like, wanting to kill yourself. Like, that's a whole different thing. And so I really, I really learned the importance of, like, medicating those issues to try and make sure that you have it at least until you get into the right headspace or you get into a right situation because like now I can say honestly like ever since I've like, tried being a little bit more uh, a little better I guess at scheduling my time at uh, trying to get to bed early like that stuff has slowly started like becoming less of an issue mm-hmm. and maybe I will get off my meds eventually but for right now like meds are an important yeah. part of that healing process, you know? When you feel episodes of depression coming on, what what are the actions you take? Go to bed early or? Uh, that, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Uh, when I actually am in the, like in it, or when I feel it coming on? When you on. feel it coming. When I feel it coming on, yeah, I sleep a lot. <laughs> I, I like, honestly, like sometimes I sleep. It's interesting because like with uh, school and everything, I've always like had, I've always had, like, set schedules that kind of make sure that I only have, like, five to six hours of sleep. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of feel like, and sometimes it's less a lot of the time. Well, it's less, like, four. Wow. Right? So I'm always, like, waking up, just t- super tired. But then I'll just have, like, moments where I sleep for, like, 17 hours. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Your 
body's catching yeah, up. Yeah, but that's because of the depressive episodes. Like, I just, I don't get out of bed. But after those, interestingly enough, like, it's like my body, like, it sucks in the moment. But, like, my after those episodes, like, my body feels, like, kind of rejuvenated in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And I feel, like, okay. Like, this whole Christmas break, I took work off because I was, like, I'm not going to... Treat yourself. <laughs> yeah, I was, like, I'm not going to worry about stuff. I'm just going to sleep as much as I want. And not have to stress out about it. Because I honestly think with like adulthood and that sort of stuff coming. And graduation and jobs and stuff like. That might go away again. <laughs> and so I'm like. Let me just get as much as I possibly can. Just to at least try and heal a little bit more than I was. Because I've been doing this for years to be honest with you. Like graveyard shifts and. Yeah. It's just not healthy. And so. I'm trying to get back into a healthy. A healthier spot. Basically. What would you tell someone? That's fighting the demons and depression and suicide. I honestly tell everyone therapy. I tell everyone therapy. I tell everyone to be okay with medicine. Like I'm like, if it, if you feel like it, right? Mm-hmm. There's most serious cases, but if you really feel like you need to reach out to someone, like therapy, as expensive as it is, is so much. It's so worth it. Yeah. Because it sounds. It sounds like weird when you say like I'm just gonna go talk to someone for a couple hours. And that was my thing. I was like, I'm not going to pay someone to just yeah. listen to me for a couple hours. But, like, you can be open to that person because they're a total stranger who literally can help give you, like, tools to change your life, right? Like, they're trained in that way. And so that's been, like, a huge help. But the other thing, like, just, like, regular stuff you can do is, again, sleep. And honestly, for me, what I like to do is I take a break from Everything that I know is putting pressure on me. Um, I delete my social media. I take breaks <laughs> every now and then. Where I'm just like, I'm not going to do it. Good for you. Um, and if I feel too much pressure now, I'm like, like for instance, like Provo Whole Life, I haven't posted one there in a while. I don't push pressure on myself for those sort of things. I'm not like, oh, I need to be posting. I need to be doing that stuff. Because that's not, you know, at that point, it's no longer a high. It's a, it's a low because, yeah. you know, suddenly like being like, well, I... I don't post it and then you get disappointed when it doesn't perform as well as you thought it was going to perform Mm -hmm. so now I just post stuff to just post so do that take breaks from the stuff that you know for a fact pressure you like if you're feeling like school's got a bit of a mess don't stress about it I know from for a fact that like my professors have been pretty good about like making uh, exceptions in a lot of ways throughout my school career when I am going through that stuff I always like just look at you as again perspective, but like things will work out. It, you know, it always you, does. You can't get through depression by adding to the panic and the stress more and more. You can't be like, well, no, I can't do. It. You really need to just take time to heal. And like, if there's a paper that's due and it's a bit of a stress, don't worry about it. You may get a little grade if you hand it in a little bit later, but like, don't worry about it. Like, get it done when you can so that you can actually perform how you're supposed to perform you know i agree so that's that that's usually what that's how i'm dealing with it right now it's yeah. like i just don't worry i just don't stress like life will progress the way it's supposed to progress and if it doesn't it doesn't right like i don't know and maybe that's and i'm seeing through stuff through rose tinted glasses but like i don't know it just it life has been way better since i've done it so it's good to anybody that's listening or watching, if you are feeling depressed or suicidal, we insist, please get help, talk to a therapist, reach out to family and friends, they can help you or not yeah. alone in this at, at all. Yeah, I agree. Especially siblings. Reach out to your siblings. I feel it in my heart. They are so good. If you have siblings. If not, reach out to any family member. How did your parents help you at this time? Did they, were they aware of what was going on? They, I, feel, I, I think they kind of feel a little bit helpless. In a lot of ways, they try and they, you know, they call as much as they can. I honestly had like a bit of a phase where I just didn't talk to my parents because mm-hmm. I kind of felt bad the whole time about this stuff. Um, one, because like I come out to them and I just kind of felt weird about talking about it with them. Um, and I think they thought that like I hated them or something or I blamed them for stuff. And I was just like, I wanted to say like that wasn't the case. I wanted to be like, that is not how I feel, like, I really, but I just was too scared. I was too nervous. And so I feel like sometimes they feel a little bit, like, stressed out. But I think the more that I communicated those feelings, yeah. 
the easier it became to express it to them and the easier it became for me to understand that like they're a support system like the other night I had a really cool experience on social media with like a big person I had this actress share a whole bunch of like my stuff who was it? Adelaide Kane she's from a TV show called Rain it's like a big thing on the CW it's still pretty awesome though it's crazy she has like a million plus followers and everything it was wild and I was like four in the morning I was going through this stuff and I was stressing out about it and uh you can't really call anyone in Utah. All my siblings live in Utah, so I couldn't really call them. So I just called my parents, and I was like, this is how I feel. This is how I'm feeling about this whole situation. Like, I was like, huh, and they just kind of calmed me down. They're like, hey, don't stress about it. This is a cool thing. And I'm like, you're right, it is a cool thing. Yeah. And they're like, you know what I mean? It was just, it, it's really cool to see how communication changes a lot, of, or progresses relationships, you know? Like... I, I won't say that my parents and I have a perfect relationship either. Like, I feel like, I feel a little bit nervous. And nervous isn't the same, that's not the word I'm looking for. I feel like because I've put so many things on myself that I have kind of damaged the relationship my, my, in my own way. Mm -hmm. My parents have always been loving and caring. It's been kind of on me. You know, I had these, like, thoughts and feelings that, like, oh, I, I, they, are, they won't love me as much if I tell them I'm gay. They won't tell, they won't love me as much if I tell them that I don't want to do that thing as a major, you know? Like, those sort of things contributed to the stress and anxiety that I had towards my parents that was non-existent, you know? They've always been loving and supportive, and I just had to kind of realize that and accept it for me to gain a relationship yeah. with them. And that took me going to them, talking about stuff with them, and being like, hey, this is how I'm feeling about stuff. How do you feel about stuff? Yeah, that's, that's like ballsy. That's like a vulnerable discussion. That's what it sounds like. It, yeah, it is. I mean, I'm still like struggling with it, to be honest with you. Like, I'm sure they'll tell you. Like, I'm a really bad texter. I'm a really bad caller. Like, I just don't. You know this, because <laughs> you tried scheduling me for the podcast. I feel like I was annoying you so much. No, I was like, no, no. like, oh man, I don't want to annoy Dan anymore, but oh. I would ask you questions again and again. <laughs> and then, <laughs> yeah, and that's the problem, is like, I'm terrible at it. Um, but it took, <laughs> and now my parents just tell me, they're like, you haven't talked to us in a long time, you need to talk to us. And it's like, okay, I do. And it just takes me, I don't know, fucking up the courage and just being like, yeah, let me talk to them. And then now it's getting to the point where I like... We don't talk a lot, but I try my hardest to talk to them. And in terms of, back to your original question, like depression, like how they've helped me, I think a lot of the time, as even though they've been away from me, the nice thing about my parents is that they've always found ways to try and help and assist in those situations, you know? Mm -hmm. They've always looked for any option that they possibly can. And they've always talked to my siblings. They've always been like, hey, like, what can we do? How can we help? Yeah. And those were moments for us to develop a better relationship. So point. they're all, like they're obviously aware of you and trying their best to help. Yeah, when and I, yeah, when they can, yeah. you know, uh, it is hard because, and maybe people, a lot of people with depression can relate to this too. It's just like, you don't want to talk to people and you don't want to tell people things because you're scared that of the stigma that comes with yeah. telling people about depression. You're scared that you're gonna appear weird or like whiny. Yeah. Especially growing up in Zimbabwe, like that was a fear. Like I'm, I don't want them to think I'm whining, and so yeah, I think it just is. It's changing, and that's really cool. What I like about it as well is just like it's cool to watch the change happening, transitions happen from like we can't talk about certain things to like no open communication yeah. makes the world a better place. So. There definitely is a stigma around mental health, which in my opinion is awful. Yeah, if we all if there was no stigma, I feel like there'd be much many more happy people walking yeah. around or much more open to their feelings and they can get help and take care of their lives. And yeah. I honestly think that's also why we have a lot because I feel like there are some people who like open up too much. Sometimes I open up too much. I feel that. Mm -hmm. But that's because we spend so, time, so long not talking about it. And it's like we can't blame anyone for that. Like we really have to take the time to like talk out our feelings yeah. before we can get to that like nice middle ground of just like you, what you said, like happy, medium, we're all happy, we're all trying, or like at least trying to be happy. Yeah. We're all going to have happy moments and we're all going to have 
sad moments. Yeah. That's just part of being human. Yeah. But if we're open about our feelings, we can maintain that. Yeah. Mostly happy moment. <laughs> yeah. You know? I agree. Yeah. Recently, you came out as gay. Yeah. Talk us through that decision. How was how was that process for you? Uh, it was scary. I honestly wanted to do this for the long, like I'd wanted to do it for a long, long time. Um, but when I first moved here, like I said, about four years ago, I told my sister Hannah, the one I write stand up with. She, she, t I told her first. Then I told my sister Brittany. I told my sister Shelby. And I told Robert, and then my brother, and the finishing part of that was my sister Megan, who I consider to be more conservative. Okay. I consider myself more liberal. Um, I was just very nervous, because I was like, I don't know how she's going to react, you know. You don't know. Um, and I told, again, I told four of my siblings, but I was nervous about Megan, which is funny, because Megan is so loving and caring. <laughs> again, me putting my own... <laughs> I'm like, she won't love me anymore. You put up these walls. Oh, yeah, you, you make up the stuff in your mind when you know that they love and care about you, right? So I told my sister, and her and my brother-in-law were super loving and caring. She was like, I went to hair school. Like, I have so many gay friends. Like, why do you think that would be an issue? And uh, I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, they accepted it. And that was kind of like the, dis the time. That was two weeks before I posted the video. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? Like... I think, and that's when I came the perspective of, like, I think I put stuff on people that they don't, like, I'm, I put in my mind that people think of me in a particular way, or they, you know, they judge me in certain ways. It's like, no, people will react how they react, and you can't control that, yes, but, like, I don't think they're as bad as you think they are, yeah. you know? I don't think it's going to be as bad of an experience. And that was when I decided, like, I'm going to come out, I think, fully. Uh, another... Contributing fact was I was doing the dating show. Yes. I was most eligible, and I had received so many messages from girls. Um, so many messages from girls that had expressed that they loved and cared about me a lot, and they wanted to date me. How did that feel? It was really cool, but I felt so bad because I was like, oh, I will never feel the same. <laughs> and. Uh, it started reaching a peak where those girls were like, uh, like sending messages of like, I know you hate me and you know you think I'm ugly, but like, just give me a chance. Like, I was like, no, I oh, don't wow. think you're ugly. I don't think, I, and that, that again, escalated pretty quickly. flip around. I'm putting stuff on people. They started putting stuff on me. Like, they're like, he clearly doesn't like me because I'm ugly or I'm fat or I'm, you know, this sort of stuff. And I was like, that is not, that is not how I feel. Mm -hmm. Like, you know? Um, and so that was another contributing factor. And then the other factor was just like, Again, mental health. I was like, I'm tired about, I'm tired of stressing out about stuff. I'm tired of people asking me why I'm not dating or why I'm not married. Because especially in Provo, that's a big thing. It's yeah. like, why aren't you married? Why aren't you dating? Who are you dating? Singles ward is a rough place to be. Yeah. Ooh, it's awkward there. <laughs> it's terrible. And so, uh, all of those contributing factors came into, culminated into me basically choosing to come out and being open with it. It was really scary, but it was something I just decided to do. Uh, a week before, I messaged all of my very close friends that didn't know. Uh, there was a few friends uh, that did know. Uh, one of them was a girl, actually. <laughs> it's really funny. Sarah, she's a comedian with me. Um, Sarah had asked me on a date, and we had this date where we made, I think it was gumbo, or chili, I can't remember. I think it was gumbo. And I was like, oh, this is great. And uh, we did, we painted, and she was like, wow, he really loves and he cares about me. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't necessarily ghost her, I just didn't text her back. Yeah. Right? Like, she didn't message me, I didn't message her, sort of idea. Right? Like, like I think she was waiting. agreement? No, I think she was, like, waiting for me to make the next move. She was uh, like, okay. I asked him on the first day, now it's up to him to, like, ask me on the second day. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. So, and it wasn't, again, not because of the, anything else other than, like, I don't even know why I agreed to the first date, but it, a people pleaser. That's yeah. what it comes down to. Me being like, oh, I have to help her. Like, I don't know. Because it sucks being rejected, right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'll go on the first date. Went on the first date, didn't go on the second date. And then eventually we would like just hang out. And one night we sat in her car laughing and like having a good time. And I was like, oh, like, this is great. 
she messaged me that night and was like, look, can you stop sending me mixed signals? Like, um, I'm, I'm like, yes, like, I feel like we're playing games. That's so cool. Idea. Right to the point. Yeah, like Sarah, that. yeah, she's a that. strong, independent woman. Shout so. out to Sarah. <laughs> Sarah. Uh, I love her so much. She's one of my best friends. Um, and so, um, what ended up happening was, I was like, I just need to tell, tell her. So I did. I was like, hey, I am gay. And I sent it over text. Uh, Cause I think she would understand. Like I was like, I, I'm kind of I trust her a lot, mm. you know. Um, and I think feel like we, you know, I I think I based it a lot off of like political views. I was like, she'd be she'd be accepting. She's a UVE student. She's more like chill, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I was like whatever. And uh, she messaged back and was like, oh my gosh, like thank you for telling me. Like it changed the whole perspective of on that. And that was about a year ago. And from that point on, I became a lot more open with telling my friends. And I think that led up to me coming out too. It's like, mm -hmm. it was it was also really funny because she messaged me afterwards and was like, we were at, sitting at a comedy show actually. It wasn't messaging. We were sitting at a comedy show and I had just finished performing and she's like, you know, I, I don't know how I didn't see it before. <laughs> it's because especially on stage, I'm very like, yeah, yeah. like very flamboyant. Not like crazy flamboyant, but I'm flamboyant. And so she was like, I don't know how I didn't see it, but yeah, there you go. Um, and so that was like another contributing factor too, is Sarah telling Sarah, I also told my friend Coco, um, that same weekend, surprisingly, I told both of them, mm -hmm. you know, that same week, I guess, uh, shout out to Coco cause she's amazing too. But, uh, I sat in the car with her and I just told her and she was like, oh my gosh, like, are you, I like, that's so great. I'm so happy. And seeing those two reactions kind of opened me up more to telling more and more people mm -hmm. around me. Um, the people that I was most scared to come out to was obviously like my very like macho friends because I have a lot of friends who are straight heterosexual males who are like, yeah, they're just men. And yeah. I was super, I was, again, I put on these like things. I remember like one of my biggest concerns was like, what if guys think that I was attracted to them? Because like, that's something that I'm always nervous about. I'm like, I don't, I don't have those feelings at yeah. all. And I know I don't have those feelings at all. But I think they think so highly of themselves. And make him like make him rethink. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> yeah, I was like, don't flatter yourself, well, guys. I have Come a, on. I'll admit that I have a lot of like good-looking friends, but I've never been like, oh yeah, like yeah. that's how I feel. I was like, no, I've never felt that way about any of those guys. And that was the big concern. Was like, are they gonna think or put stuff on me the same way that I put stuff on them? Yeah, you know. Um, and so, but then came out and it was perfectly fine. A lot of love and support. A lot of, yeah, there was no real, like, crazy rejection, crazy, like, outpour of hatred. Like, I think if I had also, I honestly attribute that to time, too. If I had done that about, like, five years ago, I think it might have been a little bit different. For sure. You know? Uh, I think it was just the right time, right place sort of thing. And I think that's why, you know, people have to come out on their own time. Because you really have to prep the people around you, I think. To kind of know, well, not necessarily prep the people around you, but just like, you have to know that they're in the right headspace to receive, oh, that's a tweet thing, <laughs> I try to think, they're in the right headspace to receive information, uh, or that type of information, because like, I, for instance, if I had done that in 2013, I think I would have like, when I first came to BYU for like my first two semesters here, it was like two terms, spring and summer, or spring and fall, or whatever, I don't remember. If I had done that then, that was a time where at BYU, they, you know, that stuff wasn't even talked about. Yeah. You know, you weren't allowed to talk about it. Kind of seemed like it was like, punished, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Or discouraged. You almost got like immediately put into like honor code investigations and, you know, it wasn't, not necessarily like you couldn't come out as gay, but like you had a lot of a harder road to walk. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, I almost feel like a little bit cowardly. For waiting this long, you know? I feel like it might have been more pertinent in that same way if I had done it a little bit later, but I also did it at a time where I felt like I had the most influence on it, you know? Um, I felt like I had, I was kind of at a peak with the dating show where people were like, really, you know, they really liked me because they had seen me on the show. And I was mm -hmm. like, okay, well, if there's ever a time to do this, it's now when people are like, you're so amazing. Yeah. As opposed to like when it dies down, you know? Because the goal was to wait until I graduated. But I was like, no, I need to just 
do this. I think also because I understand that there's a lot more, because so many kids, especially on Provo Her Life and that sort of stuff, have had conversations like that on my page. Where yeah, the, uh, those conversations that you, those highlight stories. Yeah. Fantastic conversations. Yeah. And I had done one about gay roommates where I was, yeah. I did that for my own self. I was like, <laughs> I wanted to, I was like, how will people react? Because I was like, I'm going to come out probably. Will my roommates be like super weird? Yeah. People didn't know that at the time, but I was like, I should come out. And then I saw the reaction. I was like, I won't come out, <laughs> actually. So that was the like original stuff. But like in those conversations, I got to see a lot more of opinions. And that was the other thing is like, I don't judge people that have opposite, opposing ideas or thoughts. That's what I like about those conversations is it's like, we get to see raw, real opinions. It's about the dialogue, yeah. about the views. People need to know how other people feel so that we can answer those questions or concerns in general. So I was like, okay. And that's what happened, I feel like. Because I had a lot of people who expressed that they would never want to have like a gay roommate. Because they, you know, they, were, they would be too scared that they would be attracted to them immediately. Or you know, they'd try and look at them naked. Yeah. I don't know, it was just wild. <laughs> it's so, crazy. Yeah. But it opened the dialogue for those people to understand it. By the end of it, quite a few people had reached out and been like, okay, well, like, now I see the, uh, you know, basically, like, I, you've kind of opened my eyes in a lot of ways. Um, but also in those moments, I had seen a lot of people, you know, uh, closeted people come out to me and be like, I'm gay, this makes me scared. And I realized in that moment, like, well, maybe I've done something bad, you know? Like, maybe this isn't the right thing to do. And so, um, I knew kind of at that point too, that I was like, I need to also come out to kind of undo the bad of making people scared that they can't come out because I don't think that's the case. Um, for the majority, again, those people that had the opposing ideas were very much in the minority, but they, they, their opinions need to do, needed to be seen, you yeah, know? for sure. And so that's why I also decided to do it too. So I was like... I want people to know that this is a safe place and I can only, <laughs> it sounds so stupid because it makes me sound like I'm trying to be like, I'm a martyr for people if I die out, but I was genuinely Social like, Social justice warrior. <laughs> yeah. If I, <laughs> if I go out and I was like, if I have a bad experience, I have a bad experience, but I'm at a good point where I have enough influence that can really help people and change people's opinions, maybe. Or, so did you choose to come out, as you said, when you were at your peak to kind of give a ray of hope? to those that might be struggling with the same thing and also help with ignorance? Yeah, it was all of that stuff. Like, it was personal, obviously the personal issues that I discussed, but it, it was also, really I knew, because at first I was just going to do it, like, minorly on just my personal account and just be like, Yeah, hey. so why did you choose to, because the video, in my opinion, was really heartfelt. It was a powerful video. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest with you, I went, like, in a really weird place. <laughs> So then it took a lot, it took editing, but I had really opened up a l like a ton. I started unpacking stuff I didn't even know about, and then I went to like therapy afterwards. I was like, hey, I realized I filmed a video the other day, <laughs> and uh, I need to talk about some stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted it to be heartfelt and to discuss the things that I know a lot of other gay people struggle with just mm -hmm. from conversations with them. Like... Like, the idea that, um, because I feel like this has been, especially in the Mormon community, um, culturally, the way homosexuality has been taught, is a, it's like, it's a sex thing. It's a sinful sex thing. Where like, it's like dirty. Yeah, they, they choose to be gay because that's what they want, mm -hmm. you know. It's not really, they, they, they could be straight, but <coughs> they choose to be gay, yeah. you know. And that was... Something that was wrong for me, because uh, for me, I know for a fact that, like, for myself, I, <laughs> it's really, like, I don't fantasize nearly as much about guys sexually, more what I fantasize about is, like, I so badly want to, like, hold hands with someone, like, that's a big thing. Yeah. Like, oh, I just want to hold hands with someone, or I just want to, like, you know, like, lay next to someone that I, I truly like. Yeah. Not even love, like, I just want to lay next to someone that I like. Uh, I want to have conversations. Like, I look at all my siblings who are in, like, very successful marriages, and I'm like, I wish I could have that, you know? Um, and so I wanted people to understand that perspective, too, from the, vi from the video, as well as 
just open the dialogue and say like, open up to your friends, let them be open to you, like, there are people struggling around you and you need to be aware, basically. Yeah. And honestly, I think a lot of kids came out, at least to me personally, and I saw a, a few, not a ton, but like a few people who came out um, publicly too after that. And that was really cool to see. It was like, I think seeing the love and support that I had gotten on the post mm -hmm. made it okay for a lot of people to be like, you know, maybe the community isn't as judgmental as we think it is. For sure. You know? So... How did this, how did coming out affect your faith? Oh, that's a good question. Um, who? Uh, I'll say this. I feel very strongly, I had a conversation with my siblings about this the other day, actually, like a few weeks ago, because they were asking me about like where I'm at, essentially, with that. Like with, with, like with, with but like religion. the religion, yeah, okay. or like the church and that sort of stuff. And I can honestly say, like, I still very much believe in God and Jesus Christ, that sort of stuff. But it does make it confusing, right? Like, I will say that I may be not as comfortable with a lot of, like, teachings from the church, but that doesn't mean necessarily that I blame the church for that, you know? Um, I truly believe that in order to create, again, a balance, you have to kind of have those contra contradicting views. Um, and I think that will change over time through more and more people in the church coming out. That isn't to say that I think, like, the church will like have I honestly don't believe the church will ever like have like gay marriages in the temple or that may be discouraging to some people but that's just something that I know I just don't feel yeah and right like I'm just like okay they clearly have they're pretty staunch on a couple things yeah. and one of those things is well feeling that how does it make you feel being a gay man uh it's rough and honestly again to be very honest I don't necessarily know exactly how I feel towards people's views in the church that, like, it's wrong, right? Uh, I don't personally feel like it's wrong. Uh, homosexuality, I don't think it's bad. Because, again, from my perspective, I don't think they're seeing it the same way that I'm seeing it, right? They're not seeing it from the perspective of, Oh, they want love. It's, uh, oh, they want sex. They want, they're lustful, basically. Yeah. They can't control their urges. Yeah, they, like, yeah. Urges the... and it's like, well, if you had a whole bunch of guys telling you that you couldn't have sex, yeah. right, I guess, like, if I was telling you right now, like, I'm like, oh, no, you can't actually have sex with your wife anymore. Like, that would be pretty... Pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty bad. I'd be like, well, who the heck are you to tell me what to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... And so, I think that's always made me question a lot of stuff. That being said, again, I, I don't, you know, a lot of people have been like, well, like, do you blame the church? Do you do that sort of stuff? And it's like, no, like, for me, if I don't agree with something, I'm not going to continue with it, right? Like, if something doesn't necessarily, like, meet my expectations, I won't continue with it. But for now, I feel okay with where the church is at. I think I just have to start pushing that conversation more yeah. for people to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, there won't be any changes. There won't be anything that like really progresses the conversation without people being in the church saying like, Hey, you might be a little bit wrong with that perspective, you know? And so for me right now, that's what I'm trying to figure out. I will honestly say that I'm very much in a very, very up in the air, very confusing place with my faith in terms, not in terms of God or Jesus Christ or that sort of stuff, but, like, uh, what I've grown up with in uh, Latter-day Saint faith. Yeah. I am still trying to navigate that. I'm still trying to understand it because, obviously, I know there's a God for myself. And I am trying to understand how, again, navigate the, the fact that I, like, came to terms with that because of the church. And so, yeah, 
I'm, yeah, it's hard to put it into words because I am so confused. <laughs> like, yeah. that's what I'm learning. It's like, it, it's super hard to like articulate my feelings towards it because again, I really don't know quite where I'm at yet. And that's something that I have to honestly, I have to be honest about, truly. Yeah, I can't, sure. I can't go around and be like, well, yeah, I, like, I'm so down for everything and act and fake like I'm happy about everything. I'm not happy about every aspect, mm -hmm. but I don't think anyone is truly happy about their particular faith or their faith culture, you know? There's things that we all want to fix and there's things that we all want to change. And sometimes that will change and sometimes it won't. And we just have to be okay with that. And yeah, so it's it's been rough and it's been hard, but I think eventually I'll figure it out, you know? I think it might take some time, but like I'm okay with whatever does come around, so. Mm -hmm. How would you fix the attitude attitude towards gay people in the church? Uh, <laughs> how would I fix that? Uh, that's a good question, though. Because, um, I mean, in my opinion, you have a lot of influence. Yeah. You have, I mean, you have several thousand followers, and, you know, maybe, I think if there was a person to help create more dialogue on this topic, it would be an individual that has influence, that has followers, that has a voice, yeah. an audience. Yeah. Um... I think it just takes that in a lot of ways. I think there's been a lot of other people who have come out as well in the church more recently who are more prominent in terms of like in the general culture, right? Like you have the Cosmo the Cuckoo guy, Charlie Bird, and you have uh, Maddie Easton, the guy who came out during yeah. his commencement or whatever. And then just other stuff like that. I think it's just, it takes a couple people, which is why it's so important and why I push it so much to just like have people come out. Because honestly, people will be angry and frustrated and not understand until someone that they know comes out as gay, you know? They, they won't understand it because they're not going to be open to those conversations. And that's why it takes people taking a risk in coming out in the culture. In the general world, like the world now is reaching a point where like coming out isn't really a big deal. But it's still a big deal in certain communities. A lot of those communities yeah. is our own community. It's still a big deal because we make it a big deal. And we also don't really, I don't, there's a lot of people in our community who don't fully comprehend or fully understand where people are coming from because they've never had to have those conversations. Yeah. They've never had to ask a gay person how they feel or why they feel the way that they feel, you know? And that's been really nice too, is like having those conversations and messages with people now. Mm -hmm. uh, people are a lot more open. That's what I also would like say too, is like, I don't, I think we're moving to a point where like, People in the church, because of so many people coming out, are more open. It's just a matter of, like, making it more of a thing that we talk about. Because now it's becoming a taboo thing. Where, like, people understand it and they have their own opinions about it, but they're not going to talk about it because it, it seems contradictory yeah. in a lot of ways. And it's like, okay, but there's a difference between contradictory and literally just having a conversation, you know? Like, I don't think that there's anything wrong with people in the church who are gay asking questions about about it, yeah. to be honest. Because I don't think it's been a big enough issue that we've been, like, that people have been asking about it. And, and you see it as well. Like, when I look at, like, I was telling my friend the other night, when I look at President Nelson, the way that he handles this sort of stuff, it's really, it's really cool to see how loving he is about it. I mean, obviously, he has his own view about it and that's okay again i don't put any blame if i don't agree with it i just don't agree with it i'm not gonna feel angry or frustrated at it i'm just gonna move on mm -hmm. but like for from what i see from president nelson is i i feel genuine love and concern for those issues now you know and i think that's the important part is people are talking about it and it will change eventually at least what can change and the hope of what can change is that we can move to a point where we can discuss it more openly, we can teach it more openly, and I think get a few more answers, you know, just yeah. about like why why it occurs because it has been so confusing. Because one of the parts that I find 
confusing for myself is I grew up with it being the sinful, it was taught as a sinful thing. Ooh, sorry. Ooh. It was taught as a sinful thing for the longest time. And then I can't remember who, which apostle it was. Um, I think it was Christopherson. Um, but D. Todd. Oh, yeah. Oh. Talking about how, well, it's, I think it was when they released the website Mormons and Gays. Okay. And they were like, uh, you're, I, that was the first time I think they had like been like, no, you're born with your sexuality, and that's just a trial that you have, right? How do you feel when, when they say it's a trial? <laughs> uh, I don't agree. Again, it's just something that I don't agree with. I yeah. can't... Or it's a burden, <sighs> or it's your cross to bear. I don't, yeah. It's a weird phrase to say. Like yeah, that. yeah. Because, well, and that's what I mean Like when I say I find it hard because... You know, you go from being taught that it's a, like, it's a sinful, crazy thing, and then you're like, no, no, it's okay to be gay because you're born gay. And it went from you, you weren't born gay to you are born gay. And that was something. And I think that's because people are trying to, like, encouraging more of those questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's more so a factor in Revelation today. I think it's just a matter of, like, are we asking enough questions personally in terms of that type of revelation if it's like if it's worth I don't know I think it's a lot more worth it for someone like myself who's in this position to say like I don't think it's a trial one because I don't feel that way it was a trial when I was stressed out about it and I couldn't talk to anyone about it it's like that was more of a trial now yeah. that I'm gay obviously like again I haven't like acted on it in any way, but like, um, it's not a trial anymore. I don't think about it nearly as much, you know? And it's like, did I make that a trial? Was, why was that a trial? I think we made it that way, mm. culturally. And two, sorry, I'm really trying to articulate my thoughts because I have to really be careful, but like, I really think in a lot of ways, the whole like trial aspect, sorry, let me just, I'm You're just going to do this again. What I think about often is I think about the fact that for myself, I try to understand my own perspective on stuff all of the time. I try to just take that in. And like I told you before with the whole depression stuff, yeah. part of that was because I was gay. I used to stress out about things all the time. One of those things being that I was gay, and I couldn't talk to anyone about it. And, um, eventually, I came to the, to the conclusion that I couldn't stress about things as much because it was going to put me in a bad place. So one of those things was, I'm just not going to stress out about me being gay. Um, and I just had to mentally block it. I was like, I'm not bad. I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person if I think about it that way. Um... And that was when it all, like, changed for me. I wasn't as depressed. I wasn't as... One, also, like, I wasn't as conscious of it. And then that's another reason why I came out was because I was like, well, if I can feel this good, like, anyone can feel yeah. this good. And I think that's why it's such a big deal in the church now is because a lot of us other gays... <laughs> it sounds like... But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the people in the LGBTQ community who have been LDS, or are LDS, uh, understand the happiness and joy that comes with coming out, and like, telling people, and being able to talk about it openly. Because, at the end of the day, it's something that we've bottled up for so long, and made into a trial, yeah. and it didn't fully make sense to us until we came to those like, conclusions, right? And that's why we want to share it. And that's why we keep encouraging so many of the church leaders and so many people around us to talk about it. It's, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, like asking church leaders to ask more questions to God. Mm -hmm. Right? Revelation's oh, yeah, a thing, yeah. and obviously there's eternal truths that like, can't be revealed. But at the end of the day, we need to know and understand this plan more particularly. Right? It's, I think it's a little unfair to say that, like, Straight people can uh, like know the full plan and understand the full plan in general, like the general plan. Yeah. 
but that gay people have their trial is to like live in confusion. Like live right? a life of solitude. Like no, I have it. Yeah, you have to just like, be in celibacy. Yeah. From, you have to live in celibacy. You have to. Uh, you have to live in celibacy. You have to just not act on it in general. You have to be able to just kind of say like, well, I don't understand. It, it's a lot of blind faith, which is fine. I understand that like faith, faith, that's faith. Faith is blind. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it seems a little unfair to say, okay, there's certain members who can have a little bit more understanding than others. Yeah. Right? Um, as well as the fact that I think it's also a little unfair, um, I think just in general to say, uh, wow, well, I lost my thought of train of thought, but I think it's just a little unfair to also say like, at the end of the day, cause this is the other thing people have told me that yeah, this is the thought I had, sorry, this is what I was trying to articulate <laughs> earlier, but I couldn't, um, uh, I've had people say to me, like, well, why, they're like, well, it, it's, it's about timing, Revelation's about timing, and people having the, you know, it's the right time to receive the right type of re revelation, and that revelation will come, you just have to have faith, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Where I come from with the, the gay thing, um, I think it's a little unfair for a lot of us to sit by because I had suicidal depression because I was closeted and I couldn't come out. Um, very suicidal. And I look at that perspective of people saying, well, like, the church members just aren't ready to receive revelation. They weren't ready. Now they are. That's why the apostles are talking about it now. Mm -hmm. And they're like, that's the trial, right? And I wonder a lot why the trial wasn't for members to immediately receive revelation that said like, well, gay people are okay to be gay, mm -hmm. right? As opposed to a whole bunch of children have to commit suicide and go through all of these crazy trials before the church members can learn to accept it. Like what more has to happen for yeah. it to be yeah. accepted. Yeah, accepted. And that's where it becomes confusing for me and where I feel a little bit frustrated. Is because I've been in that situation where you, because I don't think people understand what it's like. You literally, at certain points, you sit with your pills or your knife or whatever you've got. Sorry if this is triggering, but like you sit there and you think to yourself, well, uh, I'm good right now. And if I kill myself right now before I become gay and before I do anything gay, uh, then at least I can go to the celestial kingdom right? Uh, then I don't have to worry about this stuff. Yeah. And that kind of sucks because you're like, again, that's one that's not like, I don't think that's how God functions, yeah. right? Like that's definitely not his plan. But two, I just feel like, I feel very differently when people try to tell me that like the revelation uh, couldn't have come sooner. All right. And that isn't questioning the church, that's just saying, are the members asking those questions enough? And that's why you have so many of us members who are trying to push that conversation and say, well, we want more revelation on it. We want to understand that revelation more if it is never going to change. Yeah. Right? If, if, and like I said, I personally feel like it's not going to. But I would like, if I can understand it more, I would like to. Because at the end of the day, I would like to understand why, in the same way that like straight people have their own plan in God's plan, why gay people aren't allowed to have a part to play in that role, right? We can't produce kids. I know personally that I don't want to get into a loveless marriage. Not necessarily loveless, but just like, and part of that is attraction. Whether we like want to... Like a flameless been, marriage. I yeah, guess say. yeah. Well, sexual attraction has a big, has a yeah. big role to play sure. in marriage. And at the end of the day, like, I just don't understand why gay people don't, uh, can't be a part of that plan. Like, obviously we can't reproduce, that's the, like, and reproduce children, like, and that's the other thing. We could, but, like, it would just go, it would contradict a few things. But this, like, I just don't understand, like, why gay, why it's wrong for, like, a gay couple to raise a kid. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Why is that such a big issue? If 
the big thing and emphasis. And again, I understand like a proclamation to the family. That's not what we're questioning. What, we're under what I'm trying to understand is why those things are happening. Why, why that isn't, why we aren't allowed to understand that part because it's a quote unquote trial. Mm -hmm. oh, I hate that word. I hate yeah. That use that. And so it, it just seems a little confusing to me. I, you know, I, I, I've never wanted to like, uh, like advocate for that uh, as well. Like a, a lot of, and that's the other annoying, annoying part is like going with those questions. I had so many leaders, um, bishops who I took those questions to, but not because I was questioning my faith. I often, there's, those are not doubts. Those are just questions. Yeah. I just have questions about stuff. And they've never, and the only reason I've doubted is because there has no been, there's never been like a clear understanding or a clear way of dealing with those things. There's never been consistency in a lot of ways. I've had some amazing bishops who put me into therapy and helped me a lot. I've had some bishops that put me into conversion therapy and oh gosh. You know, crazy stuff, right? Like that sort of stuff Ooh. just wasn't helpful. Um, and it was because there was different understandings of what being gay also meant in the church too. They were still trying to say, well, like, no, you can get married though. Like you can get married to a girl. Just pray the gay way. Yeah, yeah. That sort of stuff. And it was like, that's what put me into doubting mode. Yeah, for sure. Right? That makes sense. Because I just like, at the end of the day, we go with those concerns and questions because we want to understand them. And part of that is because we want to un like understand our role, right? That's our eternal, that's everyone's eternal goal. That's why we join the church. That's why we pray. That's why we, you know, we try to understand our eternal purpose. And at the end of the day, it kind of sucks for gay people to gain an understanding of God in Jesus Christ. And then to sit back and be like, well, I guess I just don't have a role to play in what I've been taught my whole life, you know? It really feels like, at work I was talking to someone about this, this doctrine, because we're told to, you know, we love gay people, they are sons and daughters of God, and we love them. Yeah. But at the same time, homosexuality, it's, it's it, they say, oh, it's a sin, it's a trial. It feels like we're missing something right in the middle. Yeah. We're missing some doctrine, some revelation, some some policy or something yeah. to connect those dots because those ends of we love homosexuals and we love them or daughters of God and the very far end is it's a sin. Yeah. We are missing something in between to connect it because those two things are complete other sides of the of, of the of the side. You can't yeah. I don't know. I don't I don't personally for me, I don't know how I don't I, I don't know what my view is. Like yeah. Because we need to love everyone. Yeah. You know, love one another. That's the hymn. Yeah. But then we look at someone that's gay and say, oh, well, he or she, they're gay. It sucks for them. Yeah. Have fun with that trial the rest of your life. Yeah. It's all, I, I, don't, I either struggle with that view. Well, and, and that's my, that's my like, big thing. It's like I've never, you know, I've never advocated for like, uh, like anti-Mormonism in any way. Never done that. But what I don't like is when members act like having those questions or having these questions about your own eternal purpose makes you a doubter or a sinner. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> I, I think, honestly, like, the, my whole stress during this whole conversation is, like, I'm scared that people are going to think, like, oh, no, he's, he's clearly, you know, he clearly doesn't have his faith anymore and mm -hmm. he clearly doesn't, have, like, because that's what I've had to deal with. A lot of people have thought, um, you know, I, I've had people around me in my life already be like, well, you obviously didn't like pray enough about this sort of stuff. You obviously didn't read enough scriptures. You obviously didn't like try to understand it more. And it's like, no, I, I, I am like, I have tried so hard, so hard, so many times. And it gets frustrating because again, personal revelation for me, my personal revelation is I'm fine and I'm good. But it gets confusing when that message gets mixed up with other revelation. Like you said, you feel like there's like this middle ground yeah. that we're not hitting on. And I think that's because, one, consistency hasn't been a big thing on this particular issue in the church. And two, I feel like what has been taught about it is, is very vague. For sure, absolutely. And if we could just gain just a little bit more of perspective on it, I think people would be a lot more open to the idea because, again, we 
grown up in the church, there are a lot of us who have in some way gained a testimony, but the only reason we start doubting those testimonies is because people, again, put us into weird situations or boxes and make us feel uncomfortable about our own personal selves and our own personal revelation, and we don't understand or know where to go with that at a certain point. You know, like we don't understand our eternal purpose and plan. And what we want to do is simply gain that perspective so we can move forward. Yeah. You know, uh, again, I, I have a lot of questions, but like that doesn't mean necessarily that I'm doubting. That doesn't mean necessarily that I'm like, oh, I, I hate everything. Oh, I don't want to do this. It's like, no, I know a lot about all the other topics, right? It's good to have I, questions. Yeah, opinion. yeah. It, on it, well, it, again, eternal progress in the long run means you should always be having questions about everything, right? Like, there are questions that I don't, that I have that aren't about homosexuality. Yeah. I think, oh, that's another thing. People are like, oh, he only thinks about his homosexuality. <laughs> it's like, no, there are a lot of other spiritual questions that I've had and a lot of throughout my life. But the question, like, the ones that come up the most frequently now are because I'm gay. Yeah. And because that is such a big issue for a lot of people. Because why? A lot more people know a lot more gay people. A lot more people in the church are coming out as gay. And it's becoming more prominent moving forward in terms of, like, the world view. Um, and so we just have to kind of gain some understanding or perspective on it, too. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think I think it's just a matter of time before they... When I say they, the, the church, the church leadership, before they release a, a policy, a doctrine, an announcement, something to kind of connect those dots. Because I, I agree with you. I think there is something missing. Yeah. Just something, or just like a little more understanding, right? Yeah. Just a little bit more of like, because again, the only missing, the missing puzzle piece for a lot of other people is like, well, what is my eternal purpose? Your purpose is to come to earth, create life, and leave, yeah. basically, right? Your eternal purpose yeah, is yeah. to understand and gain a testimony of Jesus Christ and move on from there, right? Mm -hmm. And your, your other eternal purpose is bring life into that and helping them gain that understanding yeah. too. That's what we know homosexual, uh, I mean, heterosexual people go through. Homosexuals, that's what you're taught your whole life, and then it's just like brushed under the rug. It's just like, no, 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 no. Your trial is to, your trial is to not understand your eternal plan. And you're like, I just, I just want to know though. <laughs> So that I, I can get, yeah, yeah, like I just want to know, and it's like, no, 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 your trial is you don't have any answers right now. And you're like, <laughs> it sucks, right? Like, it sucks. And I just wish that, and I, I honestly, like you said, I think that we're at a point where the church leadership will address those things. And they are. They are doing it more frequently. They are doing it, uh, but there's very different mixed messages with a lot of people, right? Like you have different people, like President Nelson and President Oaks presenting very different Oaks is a views on the, on the same topic, right? And that's what I'm saying, like, Oaks is, you know, President Nelson's approaching it with a lot more love. Uh, President Oaks is approaching it with more of, like, a more stern, blunt yeah. attitude. I don't take offense to that either. I think a lot of people will think that, like, I do. I don't. It's fine for him to be blunt. Mm -hmm. um, it would just be nice to have that bluntness also answer a couple more questions than just don't. You yeah. know what I mean? Just a little bit more than your plan. Like, the plan of salvation needs to encompass a lot more than just, like, oh, you're born that way, good luck. Yeah. That's your plan. Is like, your purpose is to come to this earth and just live your life. And either you will get married and enter into a marriage where you're not attracted sexually to your wife, but you can make yourself that way, or you can just live lonely. Was, I may ask you, what's, what is your plan about that? My plan... Like, would you want to be married to a woman, or... <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, I had a, I had someone tell me the, the other day, um, uh, this, like, random lady, she knows people that I know, she took me out to lunch, and she was telling me about her ex-husband, she was like, you know, we were in a wonderful marriage for 10 years, and then he decided to be gay, and he left. 
and we stayed friends the whole time and she kind of like told me like well that's something that you could do maybe like you could enter into marriage and you know it's possible and uh i didn't say this to her because I did, again i'm not trying to offend anyone i'm not yeah. trying to like she's just trying damage to anyone yeah she's trying to help right like it's coming from a loving place but in that moment i just thought to myself like i know where i'm at sexually i know there are people who are bi who are yeah. perfectly fine with either or right that's fine do you for me i know that i have this is probably something super weird to admit. I used to sit and uh, force myself uh, <laughs> to be attracted to women. Like, I would watch, and I'll be honest, everyone watches pornography at some point. Mm -hmm. I watch pornography. And uh, I would sit and watch lesbian pornography to make sure that I had no chance of, like, like, you know, yeah, having any, you know, having a guy in the images yeah. or anything. I used to, I was like, I'm gonna be attracted to girls. I need to be attracted to girls to be a regular person. I'm not a normal person. I'm not a normal human being. Yeah. I'd sit there and I'd sit there, and it just wouldn't click. It just wouldn't. It just wouldn't happen the whole time. And I'd just be like so disappointed in myself, so down. And I was like, this sucks. I'm not a good person. Like, mm -hmm. I'm a bad guy, right? And for me. That's what contributes to also that, first of all, that fact. But two, is I, I like, what I was wondering about that lady, because she told me as well, she was like, when he decided to be gay, like, it caused me, like, depression and anxiety and all this sort of stuff. We had to go to therapy. I never want to do that to anyone. Yeah, it sounds awful. Because I feel the kids like, and the wife. Well, like, right now, I feel like there's also, like, a, not a lot, but there's enough guys in the church. I've heard, I've had, like, so many friends, parents like dads mm -hmm. all of a sudden come out and like run away with their lovers you know yeah. and they're like 50 and they have like six kids and that sucks too because that's going to damage the relationships you have with your parents right and it's only because previously we haven't had an open conversation about homosexuality where people can be open about it it was just you just don't talk about it yeah right now i think it's a little bit better and i think that people can talk about their sexuality a little bit more Unusual. Like, I know my sister, she had a bishop who was gay, and he said that he, you know, he's in a, a loving marriage with his wife, and they have a lot of kids. And, like, sure, like, if you can do it, yeah. I don't blame you for doing it. I'm not going to judge you if that's how you feel happy, like, that's it. But I just know that I would never be happy. Will it make you happy? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't. It just wouldn't make me. Because I honestly have thought about it so much. Like, my friend Sarah, when I was on the date with her, I was like, it would be so amazing. This would be so fantastic. Yeah. Two comedians, killing the game. Was that the fake engagement? No, that was Emily Spenlove. She's also dope. Emily, shout out to Emily. But I have sat with a lot of girls who I thought would be, like, okay, and who I've been such good friends with. And I was like, it would be so good. But every time I think about marrying that person i'm like i'm gonna hurt them yeah. you know what i mean it's not a fun thing to go through to be like hey i can never be sexually attracted yeah. to you hey like because that's that's what you want to feel in a marriage you want to feel like you're loved and cared for and you're attractive yeah no one wants to say that especially in the church but like that's what a marriage is about like you go into marriage because that person loves and cares about you one but two it makes you feel good like, you're like, yeah. wow, like, this person loves me for who I am in all aspects. Yeah. And it would suck to have a spouse that would say, I love you, and you're such a good friend, but friend. I can never be attracted yeah. to what you are, right? That's where it would suck. So and that, that wouldn't make you happy. So what, what, would, what make would make you happy? Uh, obvi obviously, I'm gay, so... Uh, that the obvious answer for that would be like, well, if I could have a husband, that would be dope. And that's the other thing. I think a lot of people think that like I would immediately be like, well, I just want to go on like a sex rampage. <laughs> I can't wait to have sex with all the men because, because well, and that's the other thing. I feel like the gay community has been seen like that because it was forced to be that for a long time. Yeah, it was yeah, very yeah. secretive, very like shady. And it's like, if it wasn't that way, you wouldn't see it that way, right? Now it's becoming more open, where people are seeing it more as like a love thing, and it's like, oh, this is a normal thing. And that's why I think a lot of people's perspectives are changing, because we aren't sitting at a point where it's like, 
yeah, shady sex stuff, yeah. right? I think that's a contributing factor, and that's what I think a lot of people want. They want that. They care about that. That would be great. I don't know. I just have to see. I mean, like, again, I um, I I don't have everything figured out in terms of like where I'm at. Oh, I, I uh, yeah, but you're still you know? processing everything. Yeah, yeah, I still, but I'm also not worried about it. You know what I mean? Again, it's something that I don't stress about. I'm not stressed about if I have a boyfriend or not right now. Like, I've gone 25, 26 years of my life not having sex, not kissing people that I like, and it hasn't been an issue. And it's still not an issue because at the end of the day, I know where I've been and I'm just trying to figure out the contributing factors around that because it's not an issue for me. I don't think about sex yeah. all the freaking time i'm not like oh i just can't deal with it not being able to date a guy i understand that what I, but what i will say is i do like that idea i enjoy that idea it would be nice if i could date a guy Every and kiss a guy a because yeah it, it would it would genuinely be a relationship where we both like each other yeah. and i that's where a lot of confusion comes for me because i'm like that doesn't seem bad yeah. That doesn't seem terrible, right? It doesn't seem terrible to want love, right? If God is love, why is that not a contributing factor? Why is it all of a sudden like a bad thing for people to not... <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, that's where the, like, the confusion for me happens. And that's where I want to... You know, I would like a little bit more perspective. Because it's at the end of the day, I understand the need. The agenda that's on the table is we need to create life. We need to bring life forward into the world. I'd just like to understand a little bit more as to why homosexuals or people that can't do that and are born that way, as we've been taught by apostles, can't play a role in like looking after the kids that don't have a family or you know what I mean, like stuff like that. Is Helping it, build the kingdom in a sense. Yeah, uh, like I just don't understand why we don't have a role, and that's where the confusion comes, and that's yeah. why. I, we just want a little bit more understanding. I don't think it's bad to say like, hey, I'd just like to know a little bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's where I'm at. When someone comes out as gay in Zimbabwe, how are they treated? Oh, it's the same. It's very, yeah, it's almost, almost worse. I remember one kid, I, and it might've changed. Again, I haven't been there in five years almost. So it's like, you know, maybe the conversation's changed. I grew up with a lot of people. There were a few people that were gay. I'd yeah. say the white community, and the black community are pretty equal in terms of like treatment of gays though in terms of like we just don't talk about it and they kind of have to find their own friends and like people that accept it but i think that's also because again there's a lot of us that have come out now and it's making it a little bit more accepting where it's like okay maybe this is something that we can learn to accept sort of yeah. idea you know but what i will say is like i grew up in a high school i remember this one kid came out as bi and uh bisexual not even gay just was like mm -hmm. i'm bi hey i think about it okay you know and everyone wanted to beat him up and one kid tried but the kid like bi kid knew like taekwondo and like oh, dang. beat the crap out of that kid so it was really kind of funny but uh because again i you're on the like i was on the sidelines like secretly gay like yeah <laughs> beat him up like i was like prove him wrong you know what i mean because you can't really come up and so because I know I don't know Taekwondo. <laughs> I was like, if I come out as gay, people are gonna be like, I'm gonna whip your ass, and they will proceed to do so. Yeah, I can't defend myself, but that kid knew what the crap he was doing. So, yeah, that was like an interesting thing. And I always grew up with, you know, people, people using slurs, people using a lot, like talking about it in a bad, in the same way that we have discussed, like. Yeah. It's so disgusting. Ugh, I can't even imagine. That's so gross. And yeah. it's like, uh, and I'll admit, like, homosexuality in terms of, like, sexual context, it might seem gross, but, like, I don't know. I'm still trying to keep I'm, I'm writing a stand-up set about that because I think it's <laughs> kind of funny that, like, it is funny. But I think it's interesting to see how people, people's perspectives have been in the past and what we're progressing to. Yeah. Zimbabwe is the same way that the LDS, LDS community is. 
I just don't have to deal with it nearly as much because I live in America now yeah, and I live sure. in Utah. So uh, more prominently, it's the LDS community. If I did it in Zimbabwe, I'm sure I'd... I think I'd actually receive a little bit more backlash, but at the same time, I didn't from a lot of like, especially members of the church out there, you know? I think the world is moving forward in the same, at the same rate that the LDS community is mo moving forward. Yeah. Like, uh, we just have to kind of gain more perspective and understanding and be open to conversation from those people to gain that understanding, you know? Yeah. Actually be open to talking about it, because uh, that's what I think I experienced, especially with like my Zimbabwean friends, knowing about it. But I, again, we're all kind of in the same generation. We understand, I think it's the older generation that we needed to worry about, and that's what we did worry about. That's what I did worry about when I was living in Zimbabwe. Yeah. I was like, I'm so scared that people are going to find out. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. Growing up in Zimbabwe, obviously playing rugby, I got sent on rugby tours, and I didn't want to go on rugby tours. And a lot of it was like, I didn't like sports. But part of that was, like, rugby tour was synonymous with, like, you had to use the showers together. Like locker room. Yeah, stuff. locker room stuff. My biggest concern was I was like, oh my gosh, like, I'm going to have to use, shower, like, a shower with other naked yeah. dudes. And, like, what if, what if I'm, like, attracted to them? Like, what if that's a thing? And eventually I just got forced by my parents onto rugby tours. And I used the showers with the guys, and that's when I understood, like, maybe I'm not as, like, sexual. I was like, this isn't a sex thing. Yeah. I was like, I'm not attracted. These are my friends. These are people that I respect and care about, mm -hmm. right? Are they attractive guys? Sure. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I am attracted to them, you know? And that's what also changed my perspective in that moment. I was like, I'm not a sex monster who's yeah. like, oh, I need sex. <laughs> You know, I'm not, like, gonna just get an erection over any naked guy. I'm not desperate for every single dude. Like, it was really, like, eye-opening. And I really appreciated that from my own perspective. Because I was like, you know, I, I can... I'm a normal human being, basically. Mm -hmm. I'm not, like, this weird phenomenon. Yeah. Like, you know, it just made me feel not so much of a... Fr as, like, I didn't feel like a freak nearly as much. Um, and that's what I liked about that situation and that progressed continuously because again there are so many people that I think are my friends or like the people that are my friends who I was concerned about and that was never a problem or issue right but I'm scared I was always scared I was always like wow like what if they think that way but the only way, reason they don't think that way is because there have been other gay people that have come forward before me who have the same perspective and if they do think that way it's up to me to be that change in that perspective. To yeah. say, like, look, not every gay guy is attracted to you. You may think that you're hot. Because <laughs> that's the other thing. It's like, there's a lot of my friends who also, like, really feel themselves. They're like, mm, I'm so <laughs> fine. Like, I'm sure they think that way. Like, oh, he must have been attracted to me at least yeah. once in his life. And I was like, no. Like, I don't know. It's just interesting. And so I think that comes with conversation. And that will come with time. The same way that it will come with time with the LDS community. Yeah, Zimbabwe sure. will change. It was illegal growing up. Oh, wow. Yeah, I couldn't, like, I was so scared. Uh, so gay pornography was illegal too. Mm -hmm. So, like, <laughs> I was too scared. I was too scared. I'll say this, uh, though. My <laughs> the first person that ever knew was my sister Hannah, which is why she asked me four years ago, five years ago, when, uh, when I came out to her. She asked me because when I was 14, she caught me looking up, like, shirtless men <laughs> on a Google search. And she was like, ah. What's he doing? <laughs> yeah, she was like, yeah, she was like, are you gay? And I was like, no. <laughs> this is, I can't even remember. I think I said it was for, like, research. And then I changed my excuse to, I was looking up shirtless woman. And <laughs> then that changed to shirtless men. <laughs> and she was like. Okay, whatever, <laughs> like, okay, and then she asked me after the fact, she was like, okay, like, clearly something was up, but, yeah, yeah again, those things happened, but I think that was, like, why I was so nervous as well, was, like, <laughs> another thing is, like, my sister didn't necessarily blackmail me, she just would, like, use that as, a, she was like, oh, I'll tell mom and dad that you were looking up, like, shirtless dudes once, and I was like, oh! But I was so scared and fearful that, like, that was going to be the perception, was, yeah. like... Because that's all she knew at the point, at that point. And I was, wasn't willing to, like, tell her, like, 
was too scared to tell her, like, oh, maybe I am gay, you know? I was like, no, I'm not. And I was so nervous about, like, my manhood, yeah. my masculinity being at threatened that I was like, I'm so scared that that's not going to be a part of my people's perception of me. Yeah, that I'm not sure. enough of a man for people. And now I'm also realizing, which is also interesting, I will say this all too. Uh, more recently, what I've also been getting from the gay community, not like the whole general gay community, but from a few people have messaged me and said like, I don't act gay enough to be in the gay community. Do you know what I mean? Like, Femi, for a sense. Yeah. Well, like, they're like, you just don't act like... And first of all, like, I feel like I do. Like, <laughs> I'm not, like, overly Femi, but I feel like I, I have gay tendencies, right? Like, I feel like I... <laughs> Again, I like, in my motivational videos, I use gay oh, slang right. all yeah. the time. I'm always like that. Sarah seeing me on stage was like, you're super flamboyant. There are those things. But I think that's something that also needs to change in general on opposite ends. It's like the gay community maybe needs to be more open to the idea that like, we don't need to be a particular type of way, yeah. you know? In the same way that like, uh, I think the LDS community thinks that we are, all, the, all gay people are the same. I think everyone needs to understand that we're all very different. And I think that's something that's changing too. It's like we're understanding that like you don't need to be a particular type of person to fit in a particular type of box, you know? You don't need to be a polygamist <laughs> polygamist person yeah. who's overly, you know, religious to be a Mormon. Just in the same way that you don't need to be an overly flamboyant, right? Yeah. I think that a lot of people... I think a lot of people are gaining that perspective and it's really kind of cool to watch, but it just takes time yeah. and we just need to be more open with it. I don't know. It's just something that I think about a lot because I'm like, what do you mean I'm not gay enough? <laughs> Cause then I also get people in my thing, like being like, you're pushing the gay agenda. And I'm like, am I, or am I not gay enough? Like what? You just gotta ignore those people. Yeah. 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 Well, no, yeah, I always do. I'm never like offended by it. And I was like, wow, these idiots. But, like, that's what I mean. Like, I'm like, can I just, can someone just tell me? Because, like, I feel so confused all the time. Like, I don't know where I'm at. So, that's always fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a weird, it's a weird thing that I'm experiencing yeah. for the first time, you know? So. Well, I definitely think it was great what you did. And I definitely think it, it is helping people, it has helped people, and will continue to help people. So, Thanks. props to you. The video was well done. Thanks. It was heartfelt. It also, I think, what I liked about it, it was an opportunity to, to teach. An opportunity to say, hey, I'm gay, but at the same time, I'm still human. Love me, respect me. Yep. We're all the same. Yep. That being said, though, I want to ask you about Provo's most eligible. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> How was that experience? It was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I just enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't nearly... <laughs> Biggest question is, like, if you knew you were gay at the time... Why, like, why did you go on? And the full answer is, I knew I was gay, but they, I had promoted the show when the first season came out, and I was like, oh, this is funny and cringy. Yeah. Then they really were like, cringy. we're doing a second season, and we're going to have Bachelor, like the Bachelorette. Yeah. And we're taking applications for guys and girls. And so I was like, oh. As a joke, I posted on Provo Life, like, should I do a dating show? And everyone was like, yes, do it. So I was like, great. I threw in an application and I was like, ah, oh, but you're gay. You probably shouldn't do it. And then the email came through and it was like, you've got the part to play or you've got an interview basically. Yeah. And I was like, okay, you've got an interview for this. And I was like, okay, I'll just miss the interview because I know I'm gay. <laughs> so I was like, I just want to be on the show. Then um, I, was, I sent a message and I was like, oops, I guess I missed the show. So now we can't do anything. Then what ended up happening was that the producers were like, no, you can come in for the second interview, it doesn't matter. Like, they wanted you in that they show. They wanted me on the show. <laughs> so I was like, okay, whatever. I'll just do the show. I'll go for the second interview, I'll do the show, because they obviously want me, and the girl will probably eliminate me after the first or second week. Mm -hmm. And I was like, tops. Tops, I'll get two weeks in, yeah. and it'll be fine. Then I started doing the show, and B really liked me because I was just like the gay best friend the whole time. <laughs> it was just like talkative and like we just had banter all the time, you know? And she had a couple douches along the way, <laughs> I don't know. All of them are, and I'll say that, all of the guys are great. 
Like, there wasn't anyone that I didn't get along with, necessarily. After the fact, after the show was done, like, sure, like, there was a lot of drama, but that wasn't my own personal drama. That was other people's drama, and I was getting drama dragged, sense. dragged into it. Well, people broke up, and then it was like, you need to pick sides, and blah, blah, blah. Oh, well. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like, no, can we all just be normal human? Yeah. You dated for, what? All of them. It was like, you dated on a show for six weeks, some of you a little bit extra, like, if we're adults here, did it suck? And did you fall in love for a couple of you? Yeah. For others, it's like, mm, did yeah, you fall in love yeah. or are you just offended? You know what yeah. I mean? And so that was just the kind of perspective I've gained over the past few weeks in particular. It's just like, after the show finished, I was like, why did we cause all this drama for nothing? Like, in the moment I was like, yeah, this is outrageous <laughs> and terrible. But like, I look back at it and I'm like, we really like, we really caused some rubbish amongst each other. You know what I mean? And so that's why I was, yeah, it was just a bit weird after the fact. But during the show, everyone got along, everyone was fine. I mean, obviously there was the awkward moments, like there was the karaoke Austin moment, but like, and you know, again, I don't think it was wrong for him to change teams. What I didn't think it was good was the way he did it. You know? So what happened that moment? I thought, we were just I... filming. I had actually told B, I asked B if I could get kicked off the show. <laughs> that same day. <laughs> so I asked her, I'm like, hey, can I get kicked off? And she's like, yeah, that's fine. I have Austin, I have Jay, uh, I have Austin, I have Walker, and I have Keaton. It's fine. Yeah. I was like, okay, cool, whatever. She's got her options. Too, yeah, so she's got her like... options. And then Austin changed teams, and I was like, crap, I have to stay an extra week. <laughs> I had no choice, right? So I was like, okay, crap, well, I guess I'm just gonna have to stay here. But uh, obviously, like, in the moment, it just seemed more dramatic. Because it was so, like, on the nose and so, like, out of nowhere. And he was like, I'm going to call up the most beautiful girl in the room or whatever he said. Uh, Lauren. And I was like, whoa. Ooh, you're on B's team. Like, you monster. <laughs> yeah, something like, yeah, just don't use that wording. Just be like, hey, can I get Lauren to come up here and do a duet? That's an yeah. easier way to get out of the situation, right? Lauren, we're going to do a duet. <laughs> but again, just don't do that. They should have just never done that. Yeah. They should have just been like, hey, I think I'm going to switch teams. How scripted was that? Was that... No, it wasn't scripted. That happened. Wow. That just... I mean, I don't know if the producers fed, like, that idea into them, but they came up with that idea, from what I understand, by themselves. They were like, wow. we're going to we're gonna sing and change teams, and it's going to be, gonna, it's gonna be cute. Yeah. You know? Like, it'll be a cute thing. I was like, no, it wasn't cute. <laughs> like, it was like, oh, it wasn't cute. It was just scary. And, and that's what I mean. Like, I think a lot of people think that it was uh, very scripted. I'll say the most scripted parts of it were, like, the information you were getting in between scenes of all the interviews. Mm -hmm. They, like, tell us, like, oh, I heard so-and-so kissed so-and-so. And then you'd be like, whoa. And they were like, tell us about that. And you're like, whoa, you told me. They were like, just act shocked about it. That was where oh, I was gosh. like, yeah. yeah. And we had already kind of known that that was the case anyway, because a lot of people, I mean, we're at Sleepy Ridge Golf Course. There's not a lot of, like, places to go and hide a kiss. And you have cameras, so you're following, all of us are following the camera crews, or at least know where the camera yeah. crews are, so we know what's kind of going on. There's the occasional shock and, like, what? Like, oh, who would have guessed? But for the most part, we knew. And so that was just an interesting, it was just an interesting thing to be a part of in general, because, like, it was so weirdly dramatic for what it was at the time. I was like, we did a dating show and made it... it and I watch it back and I'm like, this isn't dramatic at all. Like, <laughs> why are we on camera being like... Because I, I was like, that was some cold ass shit. Like, <laughs> like, all this stuff. I was like, I don't know if it was, though. Like, I was like, it was cold, but it wasn't, like, ice cold. Also, B just went and kissed Walker outside. <laughs> I think she's okay. Like, I don't know. And I love, again, that's the other thing. I, I'll say this. I've also gained a ton of good friendships from that too. Like B and I are very good friends. She's cool. Yeah, very cool. Jake, Matt, those are the people that I mainly hang out with. Yeah. And there's other, like, like I said, everyone I don't have beef with. Like, I love and care about everyone else. I'm not as close, I'll say that. But like, there are people I'm closer to from off, set, or off the set. But like, it was just like a good time. I didn't think anything bad would ever happen and then the show started airing and all the drama went down and uh and i think the drama i'll say this as well i think the drama after the show was more valid because of like mistreatment stuff 
right? People were being mistreated, mm. and that was where the problem lies. Right? Yeah, it's not cool. Yeah, it's not cool to mistreat other human beings. Where especially on camera too. Well, yeah. Well, on camera it was fine. It was just like, why are y'all lying to yourselves? <laughs> Did you really get love that person it's after good job. six weeks? Yeah, it caused a lot of hassles. Otherwise, but like we are all. The nice thing is that we've all kind of moved on too, which is good. Um, there was all that drama, but like, people have moved on, which is also great. Are any of the girls with any of the guys still, or? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, that worked out well. Yeah, but we all still hang out. I know, you know, I'm not necessarily a part of every friend group, but uh, I know like, Lauren and Walker and Mikey and all of them hang out together, and then you have like, B and Matt and me and Jake and like, all those people, we all hang out together in general, and so like, there was some really solid friendships, and honestly like, those friendships have now fed into a larger friend group that are so supportive and like, like they helped me when that's I came cool. out as gay, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's where they, network. yeah, just like, it's nice to have good people around you, you yeah. know? And that's what I'll say about everyone on the show, is like, everyone on the show was like, genuinely a good person or innately a good person. Did we make a couple mistakes along the road? Yeah, sure. <laughs> but like, I think a lot of people were just like good people, you yeah. know? So, yeah, it was fun. I want to ask you about... Your social media. Yeah. How did you become a social media mogul? <laughs> not mogul. <laughs> not mogul. <laughs> you, You're guessing me up too much with the audience right now. <laughs> You're going to be like, wow. Yeah. How did uh, you do it? Um, That's a very Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll, no, it, but it is true. Like, it's it's been a weird journey to get to where I'm at right now, where it's like becoming a job more than anything else. Um, not a job necessarily, but I'm making like income off of it, right? Like it's that's like, awesome. That's, you, yeah, it's like cool, right? Like it's like, wow, like people like me enough yeah. to do this stuff. Um, so for that, I'd say it, it took a lot of work and effort, but it also took a lot of like being myself. Mm -hmm. Because when I first moved here, I was like, I know what social media wants. They want this. And I had all these ideas. And I knew that people liked it, a lot of my videos. But I just had to see... It was just a lot of test and trial. Being like, is this fun? Is this not nice? And then TikTok came out. Because this was the thing. When Vine was still here, I came off my mission in 2015. Mm -hmm. And Vine was... It wasn't as much of a thing, but it was still a thing, kind of. But it had had, it had, had its time. You know what I mean? It was kind of dying down, and then like, Twitter got Did rid of it. Did they kill it in 2015 yeah. or 2016? They killed it in 2016, I'm pretty sure. Okay. But again, I didn't really know how to use it anyway. So, um, and that was the thing. I had started a Vine account, and it started going places, and I started gaining followers. I remember like, I had videos that were going like, more and more viral. Not viral, but just like, getting out there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, cool, I'm gonna... I'm gonna be a Vine star, right? And then they killed it, and I'm like, oh crap, well, I can't do Vine anymore. So then I tried just doing it on Instagram, and I gained a, a lot, not a large following, but a big enough following around the area that I was like, yeah, this is fine. And then I started doing stand up comedy, and I didn't really need that anymore. And I was like, okay, I'll just do stand up. But then I started recognizing that people weren't really coming to stand-up shows, you know? A lot of people were going to, like, Divine Comedy and, like, Humor You on BYU campus, mm -hmm. the on-campus stand-up club, was kind of getting left in the dust, right? Um, one, because it was just a little more edgy. Like, we do... We talk about regular stuff, right? Like, we're still very clean comics, but, like, we talk about regular things, I think, at a human level, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think... The, the same can go for, like, Divine Comedy and everyone else. I'm not trying to roast them. They're amazing. They're fantastic people. But it's just, like, I think they have a, a lot more... They have to be a lot more refined and a lot cleaner because they're, like, family, super family, family friendly. Yeah. Because we can be a little more open on Humor You, uh, which is nice. Um, but I started recognizing that people didn't come to shows, and I was like, crap. <laughs> um, we need to change that. Um, and I recognized that I still, when I started making memes... People like them. So I was like, I'll make a meme account with the goal being it will bring people to the shows. As well as the fact that I can put my name out there and say, I, I'm a comedian, you know? It's smart business. Yeah, and there was a lot of jokes that, like, I could... There was a lot of jokes that 
didn't necessarily fit in my sets that I just wanted to make, right? Like little little things that I observed that I thought were like make a funny meme, but weren't exactly good for like a full set, yeah. you know? So I was like, okay, that'll also work out for me. So I made a bunch of memes. Um, I remember my first meme that got shared by a Mormon meme account was the Black Mormon shared one of my Christmas. I share it every year on December 1st, but it's the, like the world meme. It's like the, you know, the kid with the, yeah. like, the burning house <laughs> and she like looks back and she's like, like the world. <laughs> so I made that and that like got shared and I was like, wow, this is really cool. How'd that feel? It was, it was really, it was really, I was like, wow, these guys love my content. <laughs> And I think they had like 20,000 followers at the time That's or cool. something like that. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then what ended up happening was that it became kind of like a, a support. Because there was a lot of us who started out at the same time. Me, Mormon meme accounts. There was Celestial Latter-day Saint, Basic Pro Bro, Bishop's Office, myself. There were other accounts who have now died off, kind of. Which kind of sucks, but I can't really do anything about it. Um, but we were all starting out, and we kind of all supported each other to the point of, like, people knowing that we were, like, a big deal in terms of, like, the BYU community. Okay. Um, because we would all post each other's memes, be like, go follow them, go follow them. And then we would just, like, swap followers, you know, like, oh, follow, 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 follow. And that led to all of us kind of being generally within the same realm of popularity, and yeah, we, that's when it like initially started, I'd say like, I was like, oh, I like social media. I like memes. I like this sort of stuff, but I definitely wanted a meme account that was separate because the Probe Whole Life meme account was going to start out as like a general meme account. It wasn't going to be Mormon based, yeah. but it ended up being that just because like, that's what I relate to. And that's like, again, that's where I can put like the jokes that I can't tell about. Provo and my stand-up sets, my stand-up sets were more open to the general public, whereas, like, the meme accounts were more area-specific, yeah. which was fine. Then what ended up happening was that TikTok came out. After a long time, TikTok came out, and I was like, oh, let's do TikTok. This looks fun. Started recording, and it got super addictive, and I was like, wow, this is, like, so cool. Did you right away, or was that... No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I'll say that I did have like a, a few popular videos though. When I, it's cool. I remember the first time, the first video I had, it was one of my first like 10, I can not even remember. And it was such a, it's such a random video, but it was like me dancing and I'm like, ah, and I flick my, I don't know if you see my like weird little squiggly yes. legs. <laughs> the pink one. Yeah, the pink one. And so I had that and I like danced and I was like breaking it, oop, I was breaking it down and I like flicked my head and the hat flew. And everyone loved it on TikTok. They were like, his wig is snatched, which is like a RuPaul reference, right? Like Drag Race reference. Like, his wig is snatched. Blah, blah, blah. And I went to 90,000 likes. And then I had... Wow. There was that phase of like, uh, one day after doing this, and one day after... Uh, three months after yeah. doing... Yeah, that sort of thing. For me, I did a video where I was like... I think it was Basic White Girls. I was like, I did it. Like one day after hanging out with basic white girls, my voice got progressively high, more high pitched, and uh, yeah, it was great. And then I was like, "What?" It's like my name's Mackenzie now. I uh, I can't remember. <laughs> but uh, that video got posted on a bunch of meme accounts, um, so it wasn't necessarily like hugely popular on TikTok. I think it got up to like thirty thousand likes, mm -hmm. but a lot of other creators were using my sounds. Uh, the like the voice yeah. over because you can do that on TikTok. Mm -hmm. You can use other people's sounds, so people were using that voice, and so that led other people to my video, I guess, because they were like, "We want to use the original video because we can claim the original yeah. video," you know? Because everyone else was like hitting three hundred thousand. I was like, "How the f am I at three thirty? And these people are at three hundred thousand, and it's my sound. Like yeah. I was like so annoyed. But then I got posted on the meme accounts, and I was like, "Oh crap!" Like, you know, best vines and shit ideas and all those other ones. They were all posting, and I was like, this is like a thing. Like, I can get popular off of TikTok, yeah. but I just have to be funny about it. And I was like, okay. And for the longest time, like, I just didn't have, like, a lot of stuff, but a lot of my videos were getting posted on a bunch of meme accounts across Instagram. And that was more, like, at that moment, because TikTok wasn't huge, huge. It was still getting advertised. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, and it was like becoming popular, but it wasn't quite the thing yet. It was still like the weird like Ugh, TikTok, yeah. Ugh, like you're on TikTok, weird. And uh, so I was just like, okay, I just need to keep making content. So I posted like I had like my Ariana Grande covers where I talk about school, and I posted my uh, I had like a, my happy day. Oh, the where the words, words are, yeah. would be like yeah. love those like hey, man, I'm I was like, yeah, this is great. And then I'd say when I, the first pickup, I had three videos on TikTok out of nowhere hit. Oh, it was all my first videos that went over 100,000, but they all went from like zero to 250,000 in a matter oh of days. Gosh, that is nuts. There was one where I did like, I'm fat. It was like something like every day is fat day. One where I did the, like, there was that, like, Benny Banassi challenge where it was satisfaction. It was like, oh, yeah. Do, 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 do. I went and did it outside a uh, friend's door. And everyone was like, whoa, this is insane. And she was just, like, shocked. She was like, what the heck? Everyone was like, oh, that's so funny. And then I had the unvaccinated children. I was like, when I see their little, oh, I'm a drag. <laughs> like, all those videos popped up out of nowhere. And took me from like zero, I think I was at like 10,000. And then I went up to 20. And I was like, wow, 20,000 followers. Like, that's insane. Then I went up to 30, 50, and like slow progression. And then just before the end of the summer, I started doing the Mary videos. Mary? I love those, yeah. And everyone loved them. They were, they were fantastic. And I hit about 200,000 followers before the summer ended. Would you just wake up in the morning and be like, oh, well, I have a thousand new followers. Yeah, it was like that. That is incredible. It w like, that was the thing. You went from like, you just wake up one morning and it went from like 30 to 70 or like wow. 110 to 150. You know, you're like, Whoa, like crazy. And it still happens that way. Like, it's still like, just not as much of a thrill, I'll say that. But like, it's still like insane to be like. like who's following you? Do you, do you see that? Or? Uh, no. Wow. <laughs> Kids, I guess, on TikTok. This is Crazy. But uh, then what ended up happening was um, I got on the dating show. And right as the dating show was airing, because obviously I'm building this thing the whole summer while I'm filming mm -hmm. the show, um, which is fine. And I was telling the guys on the set, I was like, wow, like it's insane that I'm about to hit 100,000 or like I'm about to hit 200,000. Like it was so weird for me, you know? And then uh, the show came out. And as the show came out, so already I have like the Mormon base. Yeah. You know, the show and people like me and they're like, Ooh, he's the cool, chill one. He's going to be the cool fat guy on the show, right? Like, that was the whole thing. Um, I did the motivational videos. That was when the, because I'd done the motivational videos during s the summer. Uh -huh. Very like small. And they weren't quite as like polished, but they were done. Right? Like I was like, oh, this is the beginning of something, I guess. And uh, <laughs> then I came out with the motivational videos the same week that the show aired. And that's when my Instagram following went from 3,000, 4,000 up to frickin' what, 19, 20,000 now? And that's kind of where I've stayed, which is fine. I'm okay with that. And it's progressing slowly, but it's just like, it's wild. It's and then that's what's on my TikTok, the combination of the Mary videos and the motivation videos took me from 200 and now within a semester I went from 200,000 and I'm finishing, I finished off the year at 700,000. <laughs> yeah, like it's wild. Is that? <laughs> it's wild. It's crazy to just be like, oh, I gained 500,000 fans on a TikTok account Is... in a matter of what, four months? Like, Do that's people recognize you? Like... Yeah. No uh, way. Yeah, people really? take photos with me. Oh, that's awesome. And, and it's interesting. In Provo, it's more like for the dating show as well as the TikTok yeah. stuff. But like in Salt Lake, that sort of area, I obviously haven't I haven't gone out of like Utah a lot. <laughs> so I don't know necessarily about like outside of that realm. But uh, yeah, a lot of people recognize me as like the TikTok guy. They're like, I went and bought, I was here in... I don't know if you want a new location, but I was at a uh, Jordan Commons, is it? Yeah, Megaplex. The, is it the Megaplex? Is it, is it Commons or is it, what's the mall? Uh, South Town. South Town? I think it was South Town. Wherever I was. We were doing, I was getting like Christmas presents. And, uh, it, yeah. 
It was really funny because all the people that worked at the bath bomb place when my sister's kid were like, you're the guy. Oh my gosh, you're the TikTok guy. Like, what the heck? And yeah, it's just been like a slow progression of that. I mean, people take photos with me. It, like, it's, it's become like a running joke now amongst my friends and family that like, once I go out, someone's going to recognize me and someone's going to be like, you, I want to take photos with you. Uh, which is also funny because like I'm not used to that at all. Again, I'm unless you know me, I'm still very. I've been an awkward person, and I've kind of grown. The semester's been like a growing phase, but my the first time it started like re, like it was really happening was over the summer. There was a farmers market that we went to, and um, you know it had it had occasionally happened where people were like, "Can I take a photo with you?" And I was always mad awkward with all of that <laughs> stuff. Like I was always just like. Okay, it <laughs> was super weird. Um, I remember the first time it ever happened, I was in the Wilkinson Center at BYU, and this girl came up and was like, oh my gosh, my friend loves you, can I get a picture for Snapchat? And I was like, okay. And I'm with my other comedian friends, my friend Lauren, uh, who's amazing as well. So, yeah, she, <laughs> she, she's taking the picture and she's like, you can be cool, Daniel. Because I was like, <laughs> Like, standing and posing for the photos, like, polygamist, like, boy, man. Like, it was the worst. And she was like, you can be cool, Daniel. Just be like yourself. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and that happened. Um, and so that was the first time. And then at the at the farmer's market, my I remember this was when it was starting to become a little more, cons like, consistent. Mm -hmm. This girl came up to me at the farmer's market. I was like, oh, my gosh, I love you. I love your accounts. You're amazing, blah, blah, blah. I was like, thank you. What's your name? She was like, oh, whatever. And I was like, cool. You want to take a picture now? <laughs> take a picture. And like, that was it. And my sisters and my sister Hannah and my brother, Robert, as well as my brother-in-law, Alex, they all came up and they were like, you have to get better at this. <laughs> they were like, it's going to happen more frequently and you need to like learn now how to be cool about it yeah. <laughs> so that it doesn't like affect anything. Um, and so it's taken a while for me to get like used to being okay with like taking photos and like asking people questions because that's the thing it's like I just want to get out of awkward situations as quick as possible yeah. which was has been the case previously I'm learning now more so to just be like let me ask questions let me figure out who these people are because they like me and I don't know them yeah at all you know and it's a cool opportunity to meet people and gain a little more understanding about like what their life is like and what they need you know well, I feel like if you connect with them, you're probably going to have a fan for life. Yeah, exactly. Like a personal person that I'm like, hey, I like I like you, you're a cool person, blah, blah, blah. And I have, honestly, like, a few of my fans have become some of my very good friends. Yeah. Like, it's so that's, weird. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, like, they they came to, like, watch parties, or they came in, like, that has developed into a friendship of, like, hey, we're a big fan, and we like you a lot, like, do you want to be friends? Yeah. You know? And that's that's what I appreciate the most now, it's like... More so than anything else from social media is that you've gained some really solid, cool friendships that yeah. I like, can take to the bank, basically. <laughs> like, you're so cool. As well as the fact that now, it's also been kind of weird that like, I've gained friends that are like, more popular and more famous, right? Like, I have famous people messaging me and being like, hey, you're kind of a funny guy. Who's the most famous person that's messaged you? Uh... Message me would be the actress lady. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that one was wild. Um, but I've had people like post like uh, Adam Rippon retweeted really? my yeah. retweeted one of my Mary videos, and I've had tons of YouTubers like reposting it. And then people, you know, it's just like people sharing like my videos on a lot of stuff, like a lot of platforms. Like it's so interesting to see who who like whose radar I'm on. You know, what kind of person? Who's seeing your stuff. Yeah, who's seeing my stuff, and it's like, it's cool. It's just wild. With that many followers, like with TikTok, 700,000, you said, do you feel, for lack of a better term, do you feel, like, enslaved to keep producing content, to keep your fans happy? Um, I did. I get in, I, I get in debt? I don't know the right term. Yeah, 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 I did. But now... This is the other thing. I was like, when the motivation videos were coming out, I was like, oh, I can only do, I have to only do motivation videos, you know? And 
Because I was like, that's the only reason I'm popular is motivation videos. And then I looked at it and I was like, no, no, like these people aren't just following me just for my motivation videos. There's people that were here because of the Mary videos and my weird dancing videos. And like, so at that, at this point, what I'm learning is like, as long as I'm producing quality content, it doesn't matter what form it takes. Do I feel a pressure to produce stuff? Yes, but I don't feel a pressure to produce. It sounds weird, but I just don't feel the pressure to produce particular stuff anymore. I feel freedom in like doing what I want to do and what I'm happy with mm. when I'm producing my videos. Like uh, today I did a, a weird one where I was just twerking. I was just like in my bedroom. And it, it, is it going to be popular? Probably not. But like, I'm never gonna stay, like the only way you can stay relevant is if you change. Like you can't stay in the same boat. Like I guarantee you, I'll always probably do the motivation videos because they're good. Oh, I love There's them. nothing bad yeah. about like motivating people. For sure. It just matters on like, and I, I, again, the only reason I, we have the motivation videos is because I went from like the have a good day word dancing videos to like, how else can I change my motivational stuff? So maybe the motivational videos will change into something else. And they have, honestly, like I've done a ton of, other interesting motivational videos, just not necessarily me shouting at you at a cam in a camera, right? And so that's why I'm like, I'm never gonna be happy if I'm not like changing or if I'm not like, it would sound super cheesy, like, oh, you have to change to be relevant. It's like, no, I just, I wanna do what I like. And what I like is not doing the same thing over and over again because you guys like that. Like, I understand that that's what you want and I will give you that yeah. as much as I can. But like at a certain point, I also have to produce stuff that I want to produce or that I think is funny so that I can like at least take that and say like it's fun. And do are those videos popular all the time? No. But I, I have like a few that like really have been some of my most successful yeah. videos on TikTok, honestly, like get into the, you know, 300,000s. Yeah, like I think about like my, uh, I did a one where I was like Peppa. Like, uh, it was like, ac it was like me doing an accent at like a restaurant, oh, no, like yeah. paper, 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 you know, like all the different, paper? yeah, it was just all a very, <laughs> wide variation. But those videos are because I didn't want to, that video honestly was a motivation because I was, that was me moving out of the, I can only do motivational videos or Mary videos. I'm not allowed to do anything else. Mm -hmm. That video was like, I need to know that I'm okay with doing something else and I'm going to try this other thing and I did it and that went to like 300,000 and I was like cool I'm going to keep doing other stuff and again I've also had to mentally prepare myself in terms of like saying is everything going to be as popular as the Mary video or the motivational videos probably not and that took a long time for me to be like it's okay to only get 3,000 likes on a video because TikTok's kind of weird and it's algorithm based like you kind of have to be getting likes to like keep moving into like the popular like because there's the for you page mm -hmm. to get on the for you page you have to be getting tons and tons of like interactions like shares okay. and comments and uh, so the contributing factors and all that stuff but i was like i have to be okay with you know i and I, right now it's not really like three thousand it's like ten thousand or like whatever ten to twenty thousand is like the it's average good though. <laughs> yeah it's like fans that are just hopping on which is a good average right like it's like yeah for sure i have to learn to just be happy with like whatever comes my way will my twerking video be the most successful again no but that's just i was happy to do it because that was fun to do right like it's like i get to try to my bedroom <laughs> you know so and that's what i'm trying to figure out too it's like how can i be better how can i be funnier Mm, that'll come with time, you yeah. know. Do you make good money through your social media? Now I do. Yeah. That is good for you. Just like, nice. That that's been a weird, that's been a weird like journey too. It's so like, who's, who are you, working with, sponsoring? Who who's paying you? Like companies. Companies, uh, fans, just donating, <laughs> sometimes. Um, I try to like, really have. I got at the auction over Christmas. <laughs> It was fun, and it was an opportunity to meet fans, right, in the general area. Like, I yeah. could go to their house and be like, hey, who are you? Tell me about yourself. Yeah. You know? That was really fun. And then, I'm trying to think of, like, what else, but, it, yeah, it's just a matter of, like, working, like, you can do lives on TikTok. They're not the most fruitful, but 
the day. Mm -hmm. Started doing Cameo, which is like people oh, pay you to yeah. like do videos. And that's yeah, I just made seventy five bucks. Good for you. That's awesome. In like the last day, so I just filmed them all yesterday. I was like, here we go. Fifteen dollars each. Let's make this happen. That and then um, I'm trying to think if there's anything really, but like that's. That's the kind of thing that I'm dealing with right now is like figuring out. I'm obviously I have had businesses pay me money and like want me to promote stuff. Um, but I'm also trying to be choosy now. Like I'm trying not to be like, oh, I just I'm going to again, like what I said at the beginning, I'm trying to learn to say no to what I don't want to promote and what doesn't really fit my. Do you want to sell out in a sense? Yeah, not a, yeah I wouldn't say it's a sell because they're all like pretty okay companies and they're all startups and they all need the help it's just a matter of like i just don't feel connected to it you know i don't one thing that i really like doing is like promoting restaurants that don't have any exposure you know that's a really fun thing for me to do is like just go to a random restaurant post it on my profiles and just see like people be like oh yeah i, I want to try it where is this at mm -hmm. tell me how i can get there blah 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 you know those are like the things that i really appreciate because i know that that's something that I care about, you know? I like food. I'm a big food person, as you can tell. But uh, I really care about people that produce, like, good quality products, if that makes sense. And so, like, that's something that I want to be connected to. Because at the end of the day, like, that's something that will help my brand as well. Like, if a product that I'm promoting is good, then it can only make my image look good, too. Who's sponsoring you right now? Can you say I Can I be honest with you? I lost a lot of endorsements after I came out as gay. <laughs> yeah. As so I don't know if I'm at like liberty to like share that. Because I don't yeah, want to get like sued. Get yeah, I don't want to get like sued or anything. Um, but I've had companies reach out. Again, I don't know. I had a foot fetish company. I, that's an interesting one. Uh, I had a foot fetish company. Wait, what makes that look? <laughs> I'm not joking. Yeah, foot what fetish makes, company. How does that make... How do they make money? They... People create profiles and they have pictures of their feet. I get. I don't know how it works. I didn't respond to them. I should, because uh, I think it'd be funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they. Because I did a. I had a video where I talked about like being a Toho. I was like you sent feet pics to an old man. Like you're a Toho. Um, they loved that video and they were like, "Hey, do you want to like promote our company?" And I was like, "Okay, I think they're called OG Feet, so people can look them up." You know, well, maybe this is the promotion. Yeah, shut the OG feet. OG feet. But, uh, yeah, they reached out and they were like, hey, like, we want you to promote stuff. And I'm like, cool, that's great. And then I had, like, you know, I've had a lot of, like, CBD yeah. uh, companies. I've had a lot of um, apparel, a lot of clothing companies. Or, like, clothing startups. You know, people that are trying to be, like, supreme, basically. Yeah. Being like, hey, can we send you a shirt? Can we send you uh, this or that? Can you post a video? Um, and then I've had a lot of people, like, uh, a lot of people, because TikTok is very music-based, a lot of artists be like, hey, can you promote my song? Can you put it in a video? That sort of stuff. And all those things right now, currently, again, I don't have like a particular large endorsement, Yeah. but all those things pay roughly anywhere. And now I'm trying, like, again, that's the other thing. It's been figuring it out because my following has gained, again, I've gained a bigger and bigger following more so every time. But like the that can earn me anywhere between like 25 to 100 bucks, sometimes even 200, I've earned like 250. Like a post or share? For a couple posts. That's awesome. In the story, you know? And wow. so like those things all contribute to a larger sum of money. So I, I, I'd say like right now I'm at the point where I'm like, it's really cool to just kind of see, it's cool to see these like small companies. And again, that's why I share them because I know they're all like little startups, little companies that are just trying to get their voice out there, you know? Um, and as long as they're like kind of established and kind of have a good product, I'm perfectly fine to like, because I remember back in the day, I used to get contacted by every single top floral Thai, no, like floral Thai company in Utah from Provo Whole Life. And they'd be like, can you promote our stuff? And they'd always screw us over and not pay us. And like, that's messed up. it was really messed up. And uh, it took a while for them to like reach a point where they were like, okay, to. Well, that was the other thing. It was like saying no and then having, after that wave of like floral dye companies, I, like solid companies be like, hey, can 
you post something on your page for like twenty five but dollars. And I was like, Yeah, sure. That's right money, that's food money. Like I'm a poor student, so I was like, This is great and it really like it really showed me just like how how life can be for me. Because I'm not like a, a sit behind a desk type of person. It's like, oh, I could do this. Like, this could be so something is, now. Is that like your dream? Uh, no, so I'll say that too. Social media is a means to an end. I want to, I'm, so I, I have made the plan, determination, to move to New York after I'm graduated. I'm going to go do stand-up comedy out there. That's I awesome. want to do... You know, I want to do stand-up and I want to write for TV and movies and that sort of stuff. And, you know, being a social media person is not my goal, right? Like, it's a good fish to fry. Yeah, I really love that. And it's like a cool way to create content that gets me to that point. But for now, it's just like, you know, it's just, it's a fun way to, one, make it a little bit more of an income and get me out of like, <laughs> you Starting. know, yeah, yeah. And, uh... It's also just like a really fun way to create content that I love and care about and feel very passionate about because those are things that like, I don't know, it feels fun to have a support, a support system. Like I said, a lot of my followers are my friends and like, you know, I can't contact every single one, but I do like to contact them when I can. I do, I do like to interact with them. Like every time someone tags me in a video, I always like it, you know? Yeah. I always try to be, like, friendly. I always try to, like, comment on stuff because it's, like... Again, I don't know them, but, like, I know that they... They care about me, and that's important to me. So it's, like... making their day when you reach out to them, too. Yeah. And that's... That's why I want to keep doing social media. You know, I don't think it'll ever stop. Um, I think, of course, if it, like, becomes a bigger thing, sure. Like, let it be a bigger thing. But the end goal is not to be... Social media, yeah. being the end. The end goal is to just be doing, because I want like again. I'm a comedy writer, but I'm also like write movies scripts, and I write or like I have the beginnings of movie scripts, I should say, and TV pilots, and like those things that I've written are important to me, and they're my babies because I want someone to produce those things, right? So doing social media, I get to put like little micro versions of all of those things yeah. onto a little platform. But people like it, and I can take that, and show people, and say like, "Look, like this is what is possible with my content." And so, yeah, I think that's the world we just live in. It's like social media creatively is becoming a place where we can gain exposure as creatives, and like, it's been fun to watch that kind of happen. Last question for you. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned like depression, stress. So being so that's so active on social media, how do you maintain that healthy relationship with social media? Because I feel like at times it can be a silver lining. You know, you're walking that tightrope because you. Yeah. I feel like you have to constantly be on your phone, yeah. talking with your fans or posting <laughs> or you know getting your name out there. At the same time, you you want to be present in your own life. Yeah. So how do you maintain that balance? Oh, it's so hard. I'm not even gonna lie. Like it's so hard. My sister always oh, hates it because <laughs> she's like, "Can you get off of your bloody phone? Like get off of it. You're fine." So I don't know. I can't. I can't say that definitively. Like this is how I do it. What I know now, currently, is like I do need breaks. Um, just before the semester ended, I took a whole week's break. I just was like, I'm not gonna do social media for a week. Um, and even then I couldn't stay on, like, stay off of it entirely because I, I am, again, it's like becoming like a business thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, I had to jump back on after about, I stayed off of it for about five days, six days. And I had to jump back on because I had businesses reaching out to me for sort of stuff, you know. Um, but that's the thing, it's like social media, I think you just, again, have to learn Learn to take a step back and say, I'm okay with not being perfect. Yeah. And that's the other thing. I never try to come off as perfect, my social media. And that's kind of been to my demise in some ways. Like, <laughs> I know something that, like, all the social media companies hate or that people don't like is that I take my shirt off. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I'm not even joking. Yeah. 
on TikTok, uh, I've been flagged like multiple times because I take my shirt off and I just dance. I'm like, ah. <laughs> not for anything gross. I just have my shirt off and I'm dancing with my shirt off. And that's a big thing that I'm trying to push. It's like, I want to do social media and I want to like do it with, the, but I also want to, in between that, create like messages that I care passionately about, you know? Being gay, that's a thing that I can relate to and that I can advocate for. Yeah. Being fat, that's something that I can advocate for. Like, not necessarily, be fat, yeah, get fat. Um, you know, that would be kind of cool. But, um, like, body positivity. Yeah. Like, it's okay to, like, be, a, like, it's okay to look in the mirror and think that you're a sexy person if you're fat. Like, that's a perfectly fine perspective, yeah. you know? It's okay to, I don't know, like, it's okay to talk about, like, depression. It's okay to talk about all this sort of stuff. Because at the end of the day, that's who you are as a person. And so, those are things that I've been pushing for. And I think that's made it easier to do social media. Like, if I, like, the Provo Ho Life stuff. Provo Ho Life was just like memes for the longest time. And then I started having the, like, serious highlight video, like, yeah. stories. Um, and some of them are hilarious, but some of them are very serious. Like, I did the race and dating one. I did uh, the gay roommates one. I did one about Dallin H. Hoax, <laughs> uh, one of his talks when he did it. Those things have made it so much more worth it because it's, I understand, like, you can use social media for, like, a good purpose, you know? It's not just limited to, oh, I just have to be funny, and that's the way it is. Because that's not who I am as a person. I can be myself. Yeah, you're just a comic. Yeah, I'm going to be myself entirely. And that's what social media, that's what's made me popular on social media. It's like, I have just been my whole self the entire time. Um, uh, when life has sucked, I've told people life sucked. When yeah. life has been good, I've told people life's good. I've never been fake. Right? People are like, you just post your pictures because you post your shirtless pictures or your shirtless videos because you actually don't feel confident about yourself. And it's like, ah, mm, no, I feel pretty confident yeah. about myself. Like, I'm like, like, so many people are like, wow, he has super dark nipples. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> that's what it is. So, yeah, the all that sort of stuff has contributed to just me learning to love myself more, Yeah, which has been great. Does that mean that I don't have depression on, oca on occasion? Like, yeah, it causes some serious stress in my life. And in those moments, I just take a step back. Just don't post. Don't stress about it. Again, it's just the don't stress yeah. mentality. If I see something's causing pressure or putting pressure on me, I say no. And then, yeah. That's pretty much my coping mechanism at this point. It's like, I just have to not stress. Yeah. That's good. Alrighty, well... Thank you for coming on the show, Dan. Thanks, man. It was a... This was an awesome, yeah. It was a good experience. Um, for tradition, we're going to end the show with the gumballs. Where can... Where can people find you? Uh, so I'm Dan Bam Bam on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, I'm doing comedy shows on January 28th and 29th, I believe. I'll put it on Instagram. Yeah, uh, at BYU. And... Yes. And... I'm trying to think of what else I have. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty much my plan for the next couple months. It's just check me out on TikTok and check me out on my stand-up shows. So. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for watching. And please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe. We, it would mean a lot. We appreciate it. But yeah. Thank you again, Dan. Thanks, man. That's ciao, ciao, one. everyone. Ciao. Peace. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Doug.